Mosquitoes whined by my head like old American biplanes. I swatted them down like I was King Kong. More launched into dizzying waves. Jesus, I muttered, slapping my sweat slick skin each time I felt the tingle of a mosquito penetrating. I know how wrong that sounds. Imagine how it felt. It was an August night, and northern Maine was hell. The air was thick and ripe with humidity, and the woods spewed bugs like Chernobyl's blown reactor spewed radiation. I stood in the middle of the messy field behind the quaint, Cape Cod-styled Airbnb we had rented for the weekend. The grass licked to my knees, dried, yellowed, bound on three sides by thick woods, the house at my back, trees everywhere else. During the day, it was a dull, muddy view, the trees drooping and sad, the grass twisted and dead. But at night, it went alive with fireflies. Thousands of glowing bugs winked on and off, doing whatever the hell fireflies do. What do fireflies do? What's their purpose, I mean, other than leaving behind a luminescent smear when kids squash them? I'd have to Google that later. I caught some, Daddy. My daughter, Eileen, declared as she waded over to me, bright with excitement over the glowing mason jar cupped protectively to her chest. The grass rose to her neck, parting as she moved through. She was only six, small and precious, and to her, those things were very important. Look at them dance, Eileen exclaimed, thrusting the jar up at me. Is that what fireflies did? Dance. I made an impressed face at a jar of trapped bugs, a firefly prison. Was that a novel? Firefly prison? Should be. Great title. That's great, hon. But where's Mama? It's time to go inside. Um... She looked around, kind of lost. I sighed. Once I find him, it's bedtime. Fine, she huffed, bouncing off to catch more lightning bugs. As I drifted off towards a tall, scraggly, shadow-drenched forest in search of our dog, I felt a shiver ripple up my spine. It was creepy. Quiet and creepy. Mamet, I called, hating the way my words decayed out into the trees. David Mamet was our dog, a border collie still chugging on at the ripe age of 14. His muzzle grey, his eyes milky with cataracts. I had named him, and now I had apparently lost him. I jumped when I felt something loose and oily rub up against my leg. That was how Mammoth felt these days. His fur was oddly... slimy. He stood beside me, panting, a low whine building at the back of his throat. Where'd you go, buddy? I asked him. His wise and old eyes looked up at me. Before he could reply, my daughter cried out. Oh my god! I felt my neck prickle with dread. Daddy! She squealed. I couldn't see her through the grass, so I chased her voice and found her squatting on her haunches, crouched over something on the ground. The jar of fireflies, the prison, was capsized in the grass beside her. The lid sprung. Patrolled fireflies drifted out into freedom. What's wrong, honey? Are you hurt? I asked, concerned. But when she looked up at me, I saw she was smiling. Look, Daddy, she hefted it up. I caught a shooting star. What is it? My wife, Monica, asked, puzzled. She was tall, earthly beauty, with firm features and long brown hair. Her big green eyes were fixed on the thing sitting in the middle of the dining room table. It was a three-dimensional, five-pointed star about the size of a frisbee. The kind of thing you'd see topping a Christmas tree. Its construction was strange. It might have been quartz crystal. But no, it's too light for quartz, only weighing about as much as a hardcover book. Its colour was milky and opaque, marbled here and there with darker, earthly tones. Its unblemished surface smooth but not cold, its tips pointed but not sharp. Holding it, you could feel an almost deep vibration, a power resonating in its depths, leeching out. But 
That wasn't even the incredible part. Watch this, Mum, Eileen squealed. She touched one tiny index finger to the star's center, finding the slight incline that rose up between his five points. Without any sort of dramatics, the star lit up. A warm, reddish-brown light emanating from deep within its core. She touched the spot again, and the light extinguished. Okay, what? Was all my wife could say, astonished, slightly concerned. It's a shooting star, mummy. I caught a shooting star, Eileen said in one great burst. We've been seeing them all night, ratcheting through the night sky on important galactic business. That said, I didn't know what the hell this thing was, or where it had come from. My daughter claimed she had seen it hovering in the air just above the grass, said he was talking to her. Crazy, right? But she was small, and I didn't want her growing up too fast. So, I indulged her little fantasy. Eileen found it in the... field, I said, not wanting to admit I'd taken my eyes off her, if only for a moment. She found it in the field? Monica asked incredulously. She gave me a look I knew all too well. It said, And where were you? Can I keep it? Eileen begged. Please, please, please. I remember what I said next in startling clarity. It was the three sentence catalyst that had shredded through my life like an industrial combine. A great whirring blades of a tractor that would go chewing through my family, sparing only a clumpy red mess in its wake. Monica shot me a look that said, we are not keeping that, and I ignored it, not wanting to disappoint my daughter. Just for the weekend, honey, I said, but when we get home, it stays here. Could be someone else left it behind, they might want it back. My daughter squealed, wrapping me in a hug, before lugging a shooting star upstairs. Monica's face darkened, flushing with blood. She felt betrayed like I had gone behind her back. And maybe I had. But what the hell? What was the big deal? The star was harmless. I don't want that thing in the house, she hissed in my ear. What's the harm? I asked. I don't... She trailed off, shook her head. It gives me a funny feeling in the bottom of my stomach. I don't like it. What's wrong with it? You found it out in the field, Mark. And how does it glow? There's no battery panel or little charging ports. How does it light up? I sighed. Could be one of those tech things you see in the back of Christmas gift catalogs. Could be nothing to it. They have wireless charging now. She shook her head again, but I could see she was relenting, feeling silly. She pinched the bridge of her nose, sighed, looked up at me, tired. Where's Mama? I should take him out before bed. I hadn't seen him since I had to practically drag him inside. He'd been acting strange ever since we found the star, whining and violently thrashing his head like the thing emanated a high-frequency hum he didn't care for. I'm not sure. Around? When I finally did find him the next morning, curled up in the upstairs closet, he was dead. Blood crusted over his old grey muzzle, running in trickles from his eyes and nose. We buried Mamet in the back of the field, marking his grave with an oblong rock. His death had put a damper on the vacation, but I'd paid for the weekend, and despite my wife's protests, wasn't keen on leaving early. We ate dinner in silence, Aileen star on her lap, comforting her it seemed. After that, my wife and daughter built a pillow fort in the living room, the glow of the star silhouetting them through sheets and blankets. Then the world grew dark, and it was time for bed. I went to kiss Aileen goodnight when I heard her speaking in low tones. I paused outside the bedroom door and listened. Why would I do that? She was saying in a hoarse whisper. I love my mom and dad. What the hell, I thought. I eased open the door and saw Eileen sitting crisscross applesauce on the end of the bed. The star was glowing and levitating head level with her. It instantly dropped to the ground. Eileen looked up at me, startled. 
What? Then my voice caught to my throat. I couldn't think, couldn't breathe. The damn thing had been floating. What's wrong, Daddy? My daughter's voice came from a faraway place. My vision swam, pinned on the impotent star at the foot of a bed. I could almost feel my thoughts and feelings sucking toward it, like it was lassoing them out of my head. I fished for my voice. It wouldn't come. Then it did, clear as day. It was the voice of lies, of falsehoods and wrongdoings. It was my voice, but it didn't come from my mouth. It was whispered right in my ear. It said, Stay. I jumped and whirled around. Behind me, the upstairs hallway was empty. It was empty and dark, wrapped in shadow. Then it was flooded with warm, buttery light from Eileen's bedroom. I knew that light. Starlight. The air changed, moved around me, charged and alive. I slowly turned, turned, knowing what I'd find. I turned and saw the star floating just before my eyes. Floating before me, smooth and awful. It's light warm and blinding. Red liquid bloomed to its surface, swirling and dancing beneath the star's skin. I knew instantly it was the blood of my family. The world spun around me. Darkness crashed in on my vision. I had my daughter say stay as I crumbled down in the darkness. I awoke in bed, Monica dampening my forehead with a cool towel. What? I started. Shh, you need to rest. Eileen. She's fine. She's asleep with a star. I bolted up in bed, startling my wife back as there. Get it away from her. What? She looked surprised. It's comforting. It was flying. I snarled. Monica's eyes widened with surprise. Not used to that tone from me. I don't think having it is such a bad thing, she said. If it helps to process Mama's death. A cold bolt of a knee shot through my chest. Last night, she had been against letting Eileen keep it. But suddenly, it was okay. Then, I had a revelation. A slimy, awful revelation. I looked at Monica in the eyes, remembering what my daughter had said. Does it talk to you? I asked. My wife's face answered for her. The colour drained away. Her eyes darted away from mine, then instantly back. Does what talk to me? She lied. I stood up and brushed past her, storming up the hall and into my daughter's room. She was sound asleep, basked in the glow of the star, which sat harmlessly on the bedside table. I grabbed it and breezed outside without even waking her. I brushed the star center, dousing its light, and frisbee tossed it as far away as I could. It spun off, disappearing into the field with a muffled report. Then I went inside and crashed into the deepest sleep of my life. I awoke just before noon, a blast of late morning sunlight hammering through the windows. I groaned, my head pounding, felt like I'd polished off two six-packs last night. I stumbled downstairs into the kitchen. My daughter and wife were at the kitchen table eating peanut butter sandwiches. Monica and I avoided eye contact. The air was loaded, heavy with the aftermath of our conversation last night. I grabbed a mug from the cupboard. The coffee pot shattered at my feet. The mug did a second later. My wife and daughter's heads snapped back up in a bit of slapstick that would have been funny under other circumstances. But there was nothing funny about the star planted on Eileen's lap. The one I'd thrown out last night. Where? I wetted my lips. Where did you get that? Where'd I get what, Daddy? She asked. Star. All I can manage. She frowned. Beside my bed? The room swam. My breath went shallow. A cold rasp in my chest. I was going to faint again. I stared at myself on the counter. Looked my family in the eyes. I took a deep breath and they shot into focus. We're leaving right now. I bolted upstairs and started packing. Monica found me in a mess of clothes. Mark, what's with you? We're leaving early. 
I said, throwing a jacket into my suitcase. Like you suggested. I think... She hesitated. I think we should stay a while. Another week, maybe. This place is where Mamet died. The Dark Eileen's known all her life. She needs time to process that. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. What are you saying? She looked away, before summoning the nerve to meet my gaze. I extended our stay for another few days. You did what? Just until Eileen... It's no big deal. Why didn't you talk to me about this? She frowned. We did talk about it, last night. No, we didn't. I stopped, my mind racing. Had we talked about it? Last night was a blur, a hole in my memory. I remembered tossing the star into the field. But why had I thrown it outside? I couldn't remember anything beyond that. I let out a long, uneven sigh, slumped down on the bed, the weight of the world in my shoulders. Monica's hand found my back, pulled me into a hug. It felt good, warm and good. She leaned in, whispered in my ear. Stay. All at once, I remembered. I remembered last night, remembered the hovering star, remembered the word I had heard in my own voice that wasn't my own at all. I pried loose on my wife's embrace, I looked her in the eyes, and saw a dim glow flickering just behind her pupils. Starlight. A memory fought to the front of my brain, a memory of my wife and daughter sitting in that pillow fort, bathed in the star's warm, soft light. A cold blanket of fear swallowed me. I staggered to my feet. Monica's arms tried to pull me back. I wrenched free. Stay, Mark, please. I ignored her, rushed out into the dining room, my wife calling after me. Marlene was still at the dining table, her face pale, cheeks gaunt. She looked sick, like a kid from a children's hospital commercial. Stay, Daddy. My daughter groaned her voice hoarse. Can't you stay? The star was hovering beside her and spinning at incredible velocity. It was like a hacksaw blade screaming in place, its pointed tips a blur of jagged angles. It was flickering, throbbing with light. Awful, harsh light. Stay, Mark. Monica's voice in my ear. Stay with me and Eileen. But it wasn't Monica's voice at all. It was the star's voice. It was the star. Stay, Daddy. Stay. Eileen, get away from it. I screamed. But it was too late. With a great flash of light, the star shot forward and tore through my daughter. That moment is a blur, a fragment, a memory shattered by my tortured mind. I remember a great wet shredding sound, like a damp log being fed through a wood chipper. My daughter didn't scream. Her ruined body hit the floor with a thud, a hot splash of guts and blood slapping the whitewashed walls as she fell. My wife brushed past me, chanting, stay, stay, stay. She stood, arms out, a gorse splattered star hovering and twisting in the air before her. Monica looked like a worshipper, paying tribute to a lord, intoning the same word in a flat, leveled voice, stay, stay, stay. Then the star blasted forward. I remember my wife's death more clearly. A long, horrible frame of violence. The spinning star blew through her face, grinding through her beauty in a burst of red. Twists of brain blew out like shrapnel. A shard of a jawbone embedded itself in my cheek, just below my right eye. I didn't even feel it. Didn't feel the soft, warm rush of blood trickle down my face and onto my shirt. I was rooted in place. My whole body heavy, encased in lead. My wife's lifeless body pitched forward and hit the floor with a dead thump, landing beside my ruined daughter. There were tangles of bent limbs, a syrupy pool of blood expanding beneath them. And still, I heard their voices, overlapping, chanting, a cacophony of stays in both my ears. Stay, stay, stay. The star turned on me, whirring, hovering, spinning, a blur of movement. My wife and daughter's voices were getting louder. The star, drenched in their blood, spun, 
waiting for me to accept my fate, waiting for me to stay. The voices in my ear louder now, deafening, burrowing through my brain like small brown insects. Stay, stay, stay. I scraped the bottom of my soul, channeling my anger and pain and confusion in a roar. No, I screamed with everything I had. All at once, there was silence, my wife and daughter's voices gone. The star pulsed, its light blasting out, dousing the room in crimson. Then, bam, it blew through the ceiling, disappearing into the sky, leaving behind two broken things that were the loves of my lives. I collapsed over their bodies and sobbed. The next few weeks were a blur. A blur of hospital and interrogation rooms. A blur of nurses and detectives. I don't remember anything but the dull, constant ache in the center of my heart. My broken, twisted heart. The one moment I remember with any clarity is being charged with the murder of my family. As I write this, I'm currently standing trial for the deaths of my wife and daughter. No murder weapon was recovered, but detectives are convinced I must have hidden it in the vast, untouched forest sprawling the world beyond that field. What am I supposed to say? It flew off into the sky? My lawyers are fighting for an insanity plea. And maybe I am insane. After everything I've seen, I can't be sure anymore. I've thought a lot about that star, where it came from, where it went. I don't know what it was, and I'm not sure I want to. I suppose this is a cautionary tale, a warning, and if I can spare one family the agony I've gone through, I'll have succeeded. If you ever find a star in the field behind your house, or in the grass, or in the woods, leave it, and run. Forget you ever saw it. Run, and whatever you do, no matter what, don't stay. I've known Darren my whole life, but never actually known him. I could blame it on him being a quiet kid, but I can't be sure that's true, as I've never spoken to him enough to know if he actually is that quiet, or if he has simply never been given the chance to speak. I feel guilty for that now. Darren is in every one of my elementary class photos. His name has been on the signing sheet for almost every high school class I've ever taken. He's been a constant in my life. Yet, I could hardly tell you the first thing about him. Darren was picked on in school, but he wasn't bullied in the cruel, concerted way that people think of when they think bullied kid. Sure, occasionally one of the meaner kids would spit some teasing, off-handed remark his way, but it was what everyone else did to him that was especially cruel. Darren was utterly ignored. Not just by mean kids pretending not to see him, but by everyone, constantly. He was practically ignored right out of existence. Maybe it was that Darren clearly came from a poor family, or greasy hair and acne atop his skinny frame. Whatever the reason, Darren was a school pariah, his excommunication from the rest of us eventually developing into more of a tradition than anything. Everyone knew not to talk to Darren, and at some point, he learned to stop trying to talk to us. He was never spoken to at recess in elementary school, never approached at lunch in middle school, never acknowledged in the hallways of our high school. Darren didn't exist. This trend continued for as long as I knew him. Even the teachers seemed to be in on it. He was never called on to answer questions or present in front of a class. Darren never got his name called during a group reading assignment. Sometimes I would go days without even seeing him, despite his perfect attendance. I think my mind had been trained over the years to see Darren as even less than an other, as simply empty space. All it took was the distance learning forced on us by the pandemic, for my mind to have dumped all thoughts of him entirely. It was by sheer luck 
that I came across Darren's YouTube channel. My school was a bit late to the whole distance learning thing, but all my classes are online now, and the amount of time I'd sunken into YouTube had correspondingly skyrocketed. My parents can't tell the difference between the sound of YouTube videos and the sound of my class lectures, so I developed a habit of spending hours each day drifting around between recommended videos and random searches, all while my parents beamed with pride over my studiousness. I'll admit, I felt a bit guilty about it, but not enough to stop. My most recent obsession was interviews. They felt like an informative, and therefore not time-wasting, way to entertain myself. It started with interviews with cast members from movies I like, before I branched out to looking up all kinds of distinguished people I would never otherwise get to meet. It was fun to key in a name, add the word interview, and scroll search results, looking for obscure or interesting videos. Actors, scientists, conspiracy theorists, serial killers, war veterans. I loved it all. A couple months ago, I finally got around to watching Black Swan, and I've been looking for interviews with Darren Aronofsky. As I scrolled through the generic Hollywood interviews and explanations to the plot Mother, I noticed the channel called Dialogues with Darren. I clicked without even thinking. The video I'd opened was titled Dialogues with Darren, Episode 2, Mookie. It began to play, and after a moment of amazed disbelief, I realized the bony face filling the frame and staring back at me was Darren. His features were lit only by the pale light of his computer screen, and he was even skinnier than I remembered him, with greasy black curls that had grown to shoulder length and dark eyes that were watery and forlorn. The camera he was using was clearly low-end, but even despite the poor lighting and terrible video fidelity, I was certain it was Darren. Darren appeared to be set up in a dark, cluttered bedroom, I could just make out an unmade bed with no sheet on it behind him, and various pizza and microwave meal boxes littered around his floor and shelves. Darren was sitting on a desk chair to the left of the screen, an empty chair sat behind him to the right. Both chairs were angled towards the camera, and eerily lit by the only illumination in the room, Darren's computer screen. The empty chair was one of those metal and plastic moulded chairs you see at schools, and I wondered if he had stolen it. After another quick camera adjustment, Darren rolled back in his chair so that he was flush with the vacant one, scooched a bit off to the side, and began a stuttery introduction of himself in a nervous, fake television host voice. As he spoke, it occurred to me that until that moment, I had no idea what Darren's voice sounded like. Uh, hi. This is Dialogues with Darren again. Today, I got another interview with Mookie, who you might remember from our first episode. We don't have a ton of time, so, uh, without any more delay, let's go ahead and dive right in. Before we pick up, can you give us a quick reintroduction, Mookie? I glanced down at the video info. His channel had zero subscribers. This video had one view and no likes or comments. It appeared that I was the first person to have seen it. I glanced back at the video and grimaced in confusion. Darren appeared to be nodding along to something and was looking intently towards the empty chair, as though respectfully permitting someone to speak. After a moment, he looked back towards the camera. Well, I guess I can't disagree with that. So, tell me, Mookie, if you weren't an imaginary friend, what uh, other kind of work would you want to do? Again, he looked towards the chair and nodded along to silence. But after his last comment, everything clicked. Darren had made a kind of joke channel. The product of boredom and maybe the hope of being recognized for once, even if just by strangers online. It looked like he was already living a small, cramped life at home. Maybe this was just how his overcoming the same stifling listlessness felt by most people during the shutdown. As he began to ask his guest a follow-up question about aspirations for the future, I clicked out of the video and over to his channel homepage. There were only three videos uploaded so far. Dialogues with Darren, 
Mookie, Dialogues with Darren, Mookie Part 2, and Dialogues with Darren, The Watcher, all of them ranging from 4 to 6 minutes in length. None of the videos had more than one view or any comments. The channel was wholly undiscovered. Curious, I clicked on the The Watcher video. It started the same way as the last. A quick, awkward introduction in his dark, messy room, the scooching of his chair away from and to the side of the screen, and then the one-way conversation with the empty space above the other chair. Darren, like any quality host, dove right into the questions. So, uh, I think we should start with the most obvious one. Why do you watch people? He resumed nodding at nothing in the dark of the silent room, brightened only by his computer screen. He seemed tenser than in the Mookie video, his features more rigid and his posture bunched up, like someone attempting to look over the edge of a cliff without falling. After a moment, he spoke again. Well, sure, but, uh... How do you decide which people? Silence and nodding. And what happens, uh, you know, if they wake up? This time, a longer silence and more nodding. Though, I felt a trickle of cold run through me as Darren's face turned convincingly fearful. The imaginary friend thing had been comedic and goofy, but this one creeped me out. And from the worried look in his eyes, Darren was doing a good job of appearing to be creeped out too. After about a minute of respectfully nodding at nothing and waiting, Darren spoke once more, still in his wavering imitation of a television host. Well, uh, that's good to know, I suppose. For our viewers at home, you heard it. It's always better to just keep your eyes closed. For a moment, the screen flickered with static and the image refocused. Maybe it was in my head, but in that moment, I could have sworn the empty chair had moved. Not much, maybe just an inch or so back, but when I strained my eyes, it looked slightly further from Darren's chair than it had been. That, or his attempt at YouTube creepiness was getting to me. Amused, I tried myself and clicked back to his channel to hit the button to subscribe to all notifications. Darren's invisible creature interview shtick was odd. But I felt that maybe tuning in and checking out his videos would, in some way, make up for the fact that I, like everyone else, had spent the last decade ignoring him into oblivion, leaving him with nobody to talk to except his imaginary friends. Two days later, I got my first notification that Dialogue with Darren has posted a new video entitled Dialogues with Darren, Juniper Smith. I waited until the evening and pulled out my phone in bed to watch it before going to sleep. It was the same deal as before, but more than with his other videos, I found Darren's one-way discussion fascinating as I tried to piece together what he imagined the other side of his conversation to be. Thank you so much for uh, coming on today, Miss Smith. I hope it is okay to say, but uh, the dress is fantastic. So, jumping right in, I... Uh, I don't want to be rude, but I think most people would be curious. How did you pass away? Darren said the last part with cautious politeness, as though he was asking someone terminally ill how much time they had left. Silence and respectful nodding. I'm so sorry to hear that. Was anyone able to figure out what happened? Darren seemed choked up by the silence that followed. That's... Uh... Well, that's awful. I'm so sorry. He croaked emotionally. Well, what has happened since then? This was followed by an unusually long silence of about three minutes as Darren simply nodded towards the empty space next to him. I spent the time studying the empty chair, trying to detect even the slightest hint of something supernatural. But I couldn't discern anything beyond Darren, occasionally muttering, Uh-huh, or an I see, to respectfully show his imaginary guest that they simply had his attention. I practically had my nose pressed to my phone screen watching the shadows of Darren's bedroom when his sudden speech made me start. Well, that's great. Uh, really, helping little girls like that? 
It can't be easy, after what happened to you, but you do it, and that's so great. I smiled, wondering how he came up with these stories, and whether there was a Word document somewhere on his computer that had the other side of these scripts written on it. I wanted to read them, if so. Okay, yes, uh, yeah, that's right. Well, thank you for coming on, and thank you very much again for sharing your experiences, uh, Miss Smith. I think that's all our time for today, but I wish you the best, and please take care. And with that, Darren smiled meekly towards the chair next to him, turned, and scooped his own chair back up towards his computer, and, as his hand reached out of frame, the video ended. YouTube's up next loading screen came on with the rest of Mookie Part 2 that I hadn't watched queued up to play in a few seconds. Instead, I closed the app, laid back in bed, and thought about the interview I'd just watched. I decided that when school was back in regular session in my district, I was going to make a point to go and talk to Darren. I couldn't really fathom why I never had, other than because no one else did. I resolved to tell him, Hi. Ask him how his pandemic went. See how he's doing. I don't think I would mention his YouTube channel, but I would at least make an attempt to give him someone to talk to. Someone that could actually respond when he asked a question. Satisfied with my resolve, I turned over and drifted to sleep. That night, I dreamt I was laying in an unfamiliar bed, surrounded by an unnatural, smoky darkness. I tried to get up, but my muscles didn't have the power to move, no matter how hard I willed them. I darted my eyes around, trying to pierce the darkness, hoping to find a clue as to where I was. As I strained my eyes against the immobility of my head, I slowly became aware of a quiet, ragged wheezing coming from the right side of my bed above me. Instinctively, I closed my eyes tight, as if somehow that would protect me from whatever was standing over me, make it go away. I was braced for the worst, but after a few tense moments, the wheezing stopped. I kept my eyes scrunched closed for what felt like an eternity, but the room stayed silent. My heart rate eased back to normal as I calmed my mind. At last, I felt secure enough to open my eyelids and glanced with my eyes to my right. There, obscured by the blur of my peripheral vision, was a set of massive, veiny, orange eyes inches from my face, staring with hungry fixation. Medallion-sized pupils began to narrow, and the mattress creaked as whatever the bulbous eyes belonged to began to lean closer. I heard another ragged, wet wheeze from the thing an inch away from my ear, and just as I felt a panic scream well up in my throat, I awoke. I was upright in bed, sweating, my heartbeat racing in my ears. I scanned the room frantically, but there was nothing. Just the ordinary, muted darkness of a suburban home at 3am. After another hour of self-soothing, I went back to sleep, and by the time I rose the next morning, the whole ordeal felt as though it had never even happened. I continued to watch Darren's videos as they rolled in. He posted unpredictably, sometimes once a day, sometimes once a week, but Whenever I got the alert, I would queue it up, watch the video before bed, like it, then await the next one. It was by far the weirdest channel I would found on YouTube. His interviewees came to comprise of an interesting cast of characters that included the Annette twins, for whom he brought in a second chair seemingly borrowed from a dining table set, something he called the Rog, that didn't appear to answer any of his questions despite his polite prodding, and the Grey Man who, despite the sinister name, was a delightful guest who caused Darren to break his composure with gleeful laughter throughout the interview. Uh, wait, uh, so you mean that you can be anywhere? Silence, interrupted by unexpected laughter from Darren. Oh, so everything's grey? He asked, regaining himself a moment before bursting back into pitchy laughter, too contagious for even me to resist, chuckling along with, well, uh, I guess no one can accuse you of being without talents. He managed to get out from between his outbursts, wiping a tear from his eye. Looking down at the video info, I realized that The Grey Man was the first video for someone to see that wasn't me. 
the view counter read three. I smiled to myself in the dark of my bedroom. Well, shoot, Darren. Looks like you're finally getting some attention. And with that, I hit like on the video, plugged my phone in, and went to sleep. After the Grey Man, a couple of weeks went by before Dialogues with Darren showed any more activity. Then, at around midnight on Friday, while lazily browsing Netflix, my phone screen lit up with an alert. Dialogues with Darren is starting its first live video. Tune in. Having nothing better to do, and intrigued with seeing Darren do his first live act, I quietly shut my bedroom door, flopped onto bed, and opened the YouTube app on my phone. The title was, Dialogues with Darren, No Name Available, Live. The video was especially grainy this time. I wasn't surprised that Darren didn't have the best internet connection, given the quality of his camera and the appearance of his cramped room in the videos I had seen thus far. But as the pixels coalesced into something discernible, the scene largely resembled the same setup I was used to. Darren was oriented on the left side of the screen. The empty school chair was stationed on the right. Darren had already done his typical brief intro and was mid-sentence as the audio popped in. And speaking with us uh, live today, a first for the show. So thanks, uh, those who have joined us. And let's get to some questions with our guest. Darren's eyes were fixated upwards above the empty seat as though something towered above him. He appeared to be shivering, though I couldn't tell if it was the streaming quality or if a draft in the room was making him cold. So, uh, you're the first to reach out to, uh, to contact me first. Let's start with that. How did you hear about the show? Then, for the first time in any of Darren's videos, I heard a response. A sound like the blade of a butcher knife being scraped over steel broke the silence. The sound was pitchy and inconsistent, resonating as though it was simultaneously right in my ears and echoing from far away. I winced and attempted to turn the volume down, but the metallic tones remained just as loud as if I had done nothing. Darren appeared pained, but otherwise determined to politely carry on and continue to maintain his shaky host persona. Uh, yeah, that's certainly not what I expected, he said, leaving me wondering what the answer had been. And might I ask, how, uh... The metallic noise returned, cutting off Darren. His face had turned from a look of pain to a look of agony. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Usually this works with me asking the guests, uh, questions, and, uh... Again, the terrible scraping responded. I winced and tried to escape it by turning my phone to mute. But even as the no-speaker icon flashed my phone screen while I desperately squeezed the volume button down, the noise continued, as loud as if I'd done nothing. I was just about to swipe out of the video to make it stop when I noticed that Darren was talking again on the live feed. I couldn't hear his voice with the volume off. He looked panic and had shifted his body to be as far from the empty chair as possible. Concerned, I hurriedly turned my volume back up. Uh, oh, well, of course I invited you. You have to invite somebody to be, to be on the show. How does that mean it's my fault? Darren's voice was desperate, the harsh metallic noise resonant in response, and Darren's voice somehow turned even paler with childlike despair. No, no, that's not, not true. I don't want to talk to you anymore. I want you to go away. Darren seemed to be attempting to get up from his chair, but couldn't. It looked as if someone had placed an invisible weight across his narrow shoulders, too heavy for him to stand up beneath. The live feed began to pixelate making it difficult to make out what was happening in the room through the distortion. And then, for the one and only time, the terrible, metallic scraping became words to me. It felt like my ears were seeing the hidden picture in an abstract image and, for just a moment, I understood through the pain in my eardrums what it was saying to him. Hush. It's okay. You'll talk with me. For now, for always, talk 
with me. I heard Darren let out a scream that started naturally before being digitally distorted by the worsening feed. The picture pixelated further before going black, the audio cut off, and then, in an instant, everything popped back into focus again as if nothing I'd just seen had transpired. Darren's messy, dim room was empty. Two chairs sat side by side, unoccupied, lit in the white-blue glow of the computer screen. I stared in disbelief at the now silent live feed, and then, abruptly, it ended. That was the end. I called the police that night and told them what happened, trying not to sound insane. I told them that Darren had disappeared during a live YouTube feed, that I had heard a scream, and I begged them to do a wellness check. They took down the information, but I don't think anything came of it. I could tell from the disingenuous tone of the officer on the phone that she thought the whole thing was some prank by a couple of wannabe YouTube stars or something. It didn't help that when I went back to his YouTube page the next day, the account had been taken down. I contacted YouTube support to try and find out what had happened, but, well, you probably can guess how helpful YouTube support was. That same day, in a fit of despair, I tried to figure out how to contact Darren's family, intending to learn where he lived and visit. While googling for information, I learned from an obituary from 2020 that Darren was an only child whose mother had passed away last December during lockdown. Darren had been alone in the house all that time. The police probably thought he was just a depressed runaway trying to go out on a bang. To tell you the truth, I feel responsible for what happened. Darren was harmless. Just a cast out kid left alone for too long. In fact, everyone left Darren alone for so long that he became desperate, started talking to things that should never be talked to, things no one should talk to. And then, one day, those things started talking back. Are the nets cast? My father shouted from just feet away. His wrinkled hands were planted softly on the wheel of our modest trawler. The boat rocked calmly to the soft push of waves. The salty air threatened to dry my tongue out if I dared speak a word. One more to go, I called. Most trawlers had an automatic way to cast nets and bait. My father stubbornly stuck to what he called the good old fashioned way, but I'd say otherwise. I took the final cast net, cleared it off tangles, and then wrapped the white material around my arms a few times and threw it with steady hands. The net hit the water surface with a satisfying gloop and sunk below. I joined my father at the helm as he slowly steered the boat through the water. Net fishing is a family business, and despite only being 14, my father wanted me to prepare to take over. I don't mind the sea and the strange freedom that comes with travelling on a boat in the sun. I like how the wind softly brushes past me at low speeds, and how little splashes of water occasionally cool me down when it's warm, and I can't wait until I get to drive. In the distance were other trawlers, but of bigger sizes, all funded by Sato Fishing Co. Their nets were mechanical and bright red, since it's the first colour to disappear in the ocean. Dad must have noticed me staring as he grunted out of annoyance. Traitors, he huffed. Robots will take everybody's job soon. It was easy enough for him to say. I've been casting all of his nets since I was ten. The sea was quiet. Between casting the nets and pulling them back up, I'd often pick up a boot or nap. It was boring. At fourteen, I wanted to meet friends or sleep in not get up before dawn and sail out to sea. I must have been there a few minutes, when the air turned cold. The sun's intensity stopped, and its assault on my closed eyelids ended. A series of panicked mutters and shuffling came from my father's direction, and I opened my eyes to dark skies. An eerie horn echoed through the area, and accompanying it came wild tides as the sound made the water dance. Dad? I shouted in worry. The fear caused my throat to crack and pitch. 
is it? I didn't dare finish my sentence. It can't be. It's earlier than last time. My father stuttered. Nits up, now, he commanded. The boat came to a halt, and my father and I rushed to pull the nets up, and my shaky hands struggled to keep a decent grip on the hand lines. Dad, is it here? I cried out, my hands burning from the rough rope. My father never sailed out when the umubuzo was due to visit. Dad, I squeaked out as he silently lifted the mostly empty nets. Quiet, he hissed. With the nets up, my father hurried to the helm, and we headed back towards the village. Our trawler bounced over each wave, and with each jump, I was flung across the deck. It wasn't until I was knocked towards a bench that I could climb on top of it and straddle it for stability. Darkened water splashed onto the boat, the liquid assaulted me from each direction, and I struggled to keep my eyes open. The few fish in the nets flopped wildly, while some lay still after hitting the deck harshly. The ocean ceased fire for a moment as my gaze locked on a large trawler. The boat rocked harshly to a point where I feared it would tip over. Water once again attacked me, and I was forced to shut my stinging eyes. I was frightened to the point where my brain could only focus on just how scared I was. I couldn't think of how much my eyes hurt from the salty sea. But when I finally opened them again, the fear only multiplied when I searched for the trawler from earlier. It was gone. I forced myself up on shaky feet, my knees threatened to buckle me over, and with each wave, I nearly collapsed. My eyes scanned the ocean in a rush as I quickly oriented myself. I checked the horizon. It was really gone. I stared on in disbelief as a rounded shape poked out of the ocean and towards me. I swear for a moment, it looked at me. The next wave knocked me back over. I slipped and my knees scraped the damp wooden deck harshly. I crawled towards the helm cabin where my father was, my bloody knees leaving a trail that soon washed away by the ocean. I woke up with an ungodly scream. A noise I'd never heard escaped my mouth before, and my mother came rushing into my room, and as if by routine, she wrapped her arms around me and soothed me. You're at home, you're okay, you're okay, she repeated softly, her fingers ran through my short hair gently, and I found myself melting in her embrace. Moments of silence passed in a hurry, and I felt a part of lips again to speak. So, today then? I nodded at her. For the past three years, I've been able to predict the tri-yearly visit for the Yumi Bozo. My mother calmly rose from my bed and headed to the landline, ready to alert all fleets before they went out into danger. Not that they listened anyway. The bigger trawlers, especially the ones funded by Seitoko, never listened to the warnings. They paid their fishermen extra and sent them off with empty barrels to confuse the Yumi Bozo. There is folklore to suggest giving it empty barrels to confuse it. Not that it's worked. It takes one trawler and its crew every three months. My village, Ina, has only the bare necessities, with only one convenience store and not much to do. It had been rare to come across any tourists until ten years ago. A large bone jaw sat chained to a pole in the centre of our village, mere seconds from the ocean. The jaw belonged to a sea beast that ate all of the fish surrounding the town. I was only very young when this happened, but Seito Hiratami and his fleet managed to surround the creature with his nets and kill him. Hiratami himself dragged the dead animal to the shore with his boat and spent hours carving out its jaw to make sure that even in the afterlife it didn't take our fish. That's one of the reasons Seito Ko nets are so popular. However, even though Seito Hiratami saved a small fishing village from the fish-eating beast, it brought along another being that didn't feed on fish, but took down entire boats. I ran my hand across the bone carefully. Despite the ten years, it had been sitting out in different weather conditions, and it didn't look aged at all. It was huge too, bigger than an orca, plus it had a strange roundness to it. I couldn't pinpoint it to any of the sea creatures I know of. 
I stared out to the dock. Many of the smaller boats had decided to stay today, including my dad's same old trawler he's always had. I hadn't been on it since the incident three years ago. I was relieved that most of the family-owned boats were tied up and secure. In the distance, I could spot a large trawler. The rest, I imagine, had gone past the rocky bank. My attention was captured by the mutterings in an open building nearby. It's coming sooner and sooner, a male voice complained. It's every two months now, he added. Was it? I never kept track of it. It made sense though, as it felt like I had that nightmare more often. He's a Sugimoto kid. He must be cursed. How else does he know when the Yumi buzzer will arrive? Another voice rang. This one was much more familiar. Plus, his scum father is one of the reasons the family companies won't buy my nets. It was Sato Hiratami. Maybe we should feed the son to the Yumi Bozo? The first voice asked. He received a grunt of agreement from Sato. I looked back at the bone and the date engraved on the plaque. And suddenly, it all made sense. This all started because of Sato. This creature is angry because we killed it, right? It must be its ghost. I wanted to run into the building and tell them I'm not cursed, that maybe if we put the jaw back, perhaps the Yumi Buzzer would leave us be, but I knew it would be a waste of breath. The sky began to darken yet again, and the same horn echoed through the village. Goosebumps stood tall on my skin, and my body froze in fear. I had to do it now. I rushed into my father's boat and grabbed the bolt clippers he kept in the cabin. While everybody panicked and ran inside, I released the jaw from the metal restraints and tied the rope around it. I could fix this. I took the rope back to the boat and secured it tightly. My dad kept spare keys in a fake fish in the bait box so that I could start the ship with ease. I'd never driven it before, but the adrenaline pushed me forward and I could get it running. The engine bubbled and soon began propelling. The boat rushed ahead. Once the rope was stretched out, I had trouble moving forward, as if the jaw was too heavy. I pressed for more power, and eventually the bone began scraping against the ground. It left a gash in the earth behind it. The boat's engine growled as it struggled to pull, but ultimately the jaw hit the ocean. Now it was in the water, and it was much easier to pull forward. The choppy waves sent the boat further. I watched as the jaw dropped down into the darkness of the ocean. It's deep around here. In fear of it taking the ship with it, I cut the rope loose. And then I saw it. In the distance, a giant creature traveling through the water towards me. The shape was uniquely rounded, like something I had only seen once before. I rushed back to the helm and started the boat back up, and the panic soon set in. The waves around me roughened and aggressively shoved the trawler side to side, it made it difficult to drive, and I had a hard time trying to turn it around. Just as I'd faced the village, something shot up out of the water. A massive creature, 80 feet in size and a perfectly circular mouth, wide enough to fit tens of my little trawlers inside. This thing wasn't a ghost. The movement of the beast sent my boat backwards and further into the ocean. I stared into the void of its humongous mouth, past the rows of sharpened teeth and saw only blackness. I saw death. The rotting stench of decomposition invaded my nostrils and caused my eyes to water. The creature breathed in deeply with an open mouth and then shut its jaws in a snap. The sheer force of the moving water underneath me caused me to topple over and hit my head off the wooden floor. A sharp pain travelled down my spine and I grew dizzy, too dizzy to stand up. I passed out. When I woke up, I was back home. One of the families nearby had been able to witness the entire thing from the dock, and when the creature disappeared back into the water after his encounter with me, they came out and got me. The beast took three of the Seto trawlers that day, but not me. After that, it began to attack every two weeks. Many people refused to go out and fish, which meant many family companies began to suffer greatly. 
My father lectured me multiple times and even banned me from his boat. His dreams of fishing with his son had sunk, just like the jaw. One day, I double-checked the bait box and found he had moved the spare key. His ship was deemed a good luck charm and companies began to ask my dad to lead them out to sea. There were theories that our boat warded off the Yumi Bozo. One day, Saito even offered my dad a large sum of money to go out on his boat with a few of his fleet. He agreed. I feared Saito had tried to kill my father, but when he was the only boat to come out of that alive, and after this encounter, I was surprised. After that, my dad withdrew from fishing and hid in his workhouse for days. What was so different about our boat? I started to look into the differences, and it became a new obsession. It wasn't the shape or size or the color of the boats. They were very similar, except the ones that were attacked were much bigger. Homura, my friend Yua called out to me. I'd been zoning out in class again. Should we get some milk from the canteen? I shook my head, and Yua sighed. What's wrong with you? she asked. It's just these boats and the disappearances, I began. There's no difference. None of the family boats are getting attacked. It's just the big ones. It's not like they look like food. They have red nets, I huffed. I mean, there's red fish in the ocean, Yua mumbled. Kimnadai, sea breams. I'm sure there's more too. When you get to a certain depth, red disappears though. Whatever it is, it wouldn't have been able to see from below the surface. That seems dumb, she offered. Ewa's lack of concern soothed me, and a smile temporarily set my mind at ease. I passed the dock on the way from school. The ground was still raised and torn up from when I pulled the jaw across it. I looked towards the ocean, where the jaw was most likely sitting at the bottom. If it wasn't a ghost, then who did the jaw belong to? I would have thought it belonged to a smaller version of the creature with how rounded the appendage was. My hand slapped my mouth and I let out a gasp. Did we kill its baby? I shook my head and stared out to the horizon where the ocean met the sky. The jaw was huge, but compared to the beast I encountered, it was tiny. I ran home faster than I ever had before and began searching up on the internet for any hint of what the creature could be. I searched up everything imaginable and looked at multiple indexes of big sea beasts. None of the images matched up to what I saw that day. Everything about this creature didn't make sense, from its perfectly circular mouth to its enormous size, plus the fact it was eating ships. There's no way it got any sort of nutrition from the boat. Was it from this world? If we could believe in things like Yumi Bozos, then who's to say that other things didn't exist? I approached my father about the situation, how the creature could be acting on revenge or justice, and how it's only attacking boats with the red nets. I hadn't expected him to believe me so early, but he was making essential calls by the morning. Sato hesitantly sent a single fleet out with regular nets, and the rest with red, soon seeing results. But once they scrapped the red nets for standard nets, the beast began to act out. Rather than attack boats, the creature bit away at the ocean floor as if it was heading towards the village, and after three weeks, it was able to reach the docks. Sato would stand at the docks, a harpoon in one hand and a cigarette in the other. If you asked him what he was doing, he would simply proclaim, I killed the last one, I can kill this one, easy. He showed no remorse. He even cracked a joke about using its bones to make more nets, as he did with the last beast that threatened our village. His attitude made my jaw clench. The next day, the creature sat below the dock for the entire day. Sato did nothing. He refused to look at the being and retreated to his factory for an emergency. During the night, the family boats were devoured by the beast. There were questions on whether it had become impatient but somebody claimed they saw Sato throwing his red nets on them. The creature disappeared for a few days. People were enraged. Their lives had been eaten away in mere seconds. They held their anger to the beast, and despite the dark CCTV being erased, 
a nearby private camera caught Sato in action, throwing the red net over each of the boats. The atmosphere was tense, yet nobody dared speak up, and the silence only worsened the mood. It took one person to call out, and it took one person to say, It's Sato's doing, for the whole town to break into a riot. Sato fled into his home and hid inside, and a crowd followed behind. He refused to enter the village. He didn't want to acknowledge his disrespect to the creature and his slaughtering of the baby beast. Sato refused to believe that he did not save the village. Instead, he endangered it. The beast returned and sat at the dock, its mouth open at the edge. The same loud horn echoed non-stop throughout the village from the beginning, and everyone panicked to stop it. The town sacrificed food and fish. They pleaded with the creature and promised they would never do it again. But the sea beast didn't stop. The horn was deafening. I wondered if it was a battle cry or mourning its loss. Either way, it had to stop. My father had enough. With a red net in hand, he headed to Sato's house and pushed through the crowd. Sato, he boomed, but Sato continued to hide. Come out and be a man about it. There were no movements from the inside. My father was strong. We didn't need tough doors in a small village like ours. He kicked Sato's in in a few tries. A few of the men charged in with him, and they exited out with Sato and his young daughter, Yua. The two were tangled in a massive red rope. My father and the group of men began to push them. The two stumbled over the abundance of material and their own feet. Yua hit the floor at some point, but they kept pushing and pushing. Sato managed to pull Yua up, and before they knew it, they were on the wooden platform on the dock. Please, not Yua. Don't do this to my Yua, Sato sobbed. I believed him. At that moment, he was a father pleading for his daughter. She didn't do anything. She didn't know. I'm the only one that knew. The reveal that Sato knew caused an uproar. People pushed past each other, wanting to be the one to harm Sato, but my father and his friends kept them back. I turned my attention from Sato to Yua, and she was staring at me, eyes puffed as she was sobbing her eyes out, and her body spotted with mud and stone. I didn't say anything. I couldn't. I just stared back until they were led further into the dock. Everybody followed behind, shouting and jeering at the two. The horn sound grew louder and louder as the two approached, and we took it as a sign that this was the right thing. Now on the edge, Sato's pleading became more erratic. Not Yua, not Yua, he sobbed. They both refused to face the creature. Turn around, my father demanded. Sato didn't oblige, but Yua turned and stared into the mouth of the creature, my dad physically turned Sato around, and all the colour drained from his face. Yua let out a shriek. The shock caused her to drop to her knees, and her tears dropped into the abyss below. From here, I could see the familiar black descent into nothingness, and the smell of rot was far much more potent than when I encountered it. I scanned the faces of the villagers around me. Nobody had dared come to the dock while he was here, and it was their first time encountering it. Sato was silent. I stole a glance and saw him pull Yura up and hold onto one of her hands to pray. It felt like the air was getting heavier. My eardrums ached from the drone of the creature and it felt like they were ready to burst. Then, without saying anything, my father pushed them in. I watched as they fell into the nothingness of the creature's mouth and the dark abyss consumed the two. After ten years, the beast had gotten its justice. I wiped my cheek, thinking that the sea had splashed me yet again, but I was met with an abundance of tears. The creature quietened down, and its mouth snapped shut. A short push of wind brushed through the village, and then the beam dropped into the water, and disappeared. We 
called it snuff in my day, but I figured I'd update my language for the internet crowd. Most people are familiar with the acronym NSFW. It stands for not safe for work. That one is usually stamped over nudity, etc., to keep you from clicking on something you're not supposed to. NSFL is one step up from that. It means not safe for life. From what I understand, it's usually tagged over images or videos of a highly upsetting nature. Take an execution video, for example. Some unlucky schmuck getting flayed alive or chained to it apart while he's still screaming, or machete hacked limb for limb by guys in black masks. You'll see the NSFL tag before you click the video, so you know to stay away if you want to hold onto your lunch. Ever wondered who those videos are made for? Of course you have, and the answer probably sends you meat running cold, and a flash of goosebumps sprouting up over your skin. They're made for teachers, parents, friends, bus drivers, politicians, bankers. They're made for people who get off on it. People who feel a warm tingle down south at the sight of a serrated knife running through an unprotected neck. The great rush of blood around the blade. The gurgle of the dying. It gets them hot and bothered. People love it. Nowadays, you can find most of it on the internet. Animals being thrown, torched alive, drowned. All of that stuff is just a few clicks away. But back in the 90s and early 2000s, it was harder to come by. Rare stuff, like a foreign movie you'd been itching to see that hadn't gotten an American release. These were foreign films to some. Exotic is maybe a better word. Either way, I didn't realize there was such a market for the depraved until I took a job at Video Kingdom, a local video store on the outskirts of Seattle. I'm hesitant to tell you exactly where. It closed down right around the time the economy imploded, but I'm fairly certain some of our old stock might be hidden away in the dungeon. That's what we called our back room. The dungeon. Some guy would come in, usually some white collar sap with a Ned Flanders haircut and three kids at home. He trundled up to the counter, looking around like there might be FBI crouched behind the VHS racks, and he'd say, I'm here to rent a rare film, The Dungeon by Carl Hinton. There would be an exchanging of glances. I'd look him up and down, pretend like I was sizing the fella up, you know. He'd scan the place nervously, look back at me with an almost apologetic expression that said, I swear I'm not messed up. I'd shrug and lead him through the velvet curtain into the back room. We'd navigate boxes of VHS rentals. I'd pull aside an industrial shelf that concealed a hidden doorway, leading down a flight of stairs. Neon lights from a kitschy, the dungeon sign guiding the way. We'd hit a subterranean level, and the fellow's eyes would turn to saucers, a hard on tending his pants as he wandered into our sicko's paradise. Welcome to the dungeon. I bet you're picturing some dimly lit hellhole stashed with black, unmarked videotapes. Not this place. This was a classy establishment. Carpeted, panelled walls, lounge chairs. Dimly lit, sure, but like a cigar lounge dimly lit. We had back rooms with TVs so the clients could taste whatever they'd chosen from a vast array of tapes. There were dozens of categories, like any regular video store, featuring everything under the sun. We had a whole section dedicated exclusively to people being run over by steamrollers. They were scoured from all over the world, I was told. Mostly Eastern Europe, Asia. I took it as gospel. I hadn't watched any of this stuff. It should be noted that anything related to kids was forbidden. That was where we drew the line. And if some guy came asking for that, we'd send a few heavies to his house with knuckle dusters in order to maim. We were scrupulous a morally inclined organisation, but everything else, fair game. I know you're probably thinking I'm some mentally warped scumbag drifting through life one sort of video after the next. You'd be wrong. I never watched the tapes, never joined up to sell them either. I didn't know what I was getting myself into. I was 22 the summer I started working at Video Kingdom, and by the time Halloween rolled around, the owner of the place had me roped into a sick scheme. By that point, 
I was in too deep to get out. He had me by the scruff with an ugly knife tucked up against my jugular, metaphorically speaking. I'm going to spare you the story of how I got involved. It's long and boring, and surrounds me seeing something I shouldn't have while smoking weed in the storage room after work. The story of how I quit is much more interesting. I'm here to rent a rare film, he said. The Dungeon by Carl Hinton. I could tell this guy was bad news. He looked like he was grown somewhere dark and moist. A basement dwelling freakazoid. Crusty, slightly overweight. Enough grease in his hair to keep the McDonald's fryer running for a year. Big Van Helsing style leather overcoat. Combat boots. Unlike most folks, he wasn't nervous either. He was confident. Smug even. I could tell he was a veteran. That gave me pause. I was sharing air with no run-of-the-mill freak. This guy was one step away from making his own tapes. If only I'd known, I would have said, Sorry sir, we don't carry that. That's what we fed to unscrupulous figures. It was at the clerk's discretion. We had carte blanche to turn away anyone we wanted. But I didn't. I gave him the up-down. He never broke eye contact. His eyes were bright, amused. They were alive, like two black pools of oil, just waiting for a spark. I swallowed. Right this way, I said. He knew his way around the dungeon. That was odd. I'd never seen this guy before, and if he'd been a regular, I'd have known. There were a few other people browsing. One guy who looked like a wet muskrat, another who was at least 400 pounds. There was a woman too, a real dominatrix type, over six feet, hard features, prim hairdo. My guy didn't spare a glance at any of them. He hurried to the vault. That was what we called the old school vault door, tucked into the back corner of the dungeon. It had a wheel handle with a combination dial in the center. All that remained of the bank that used to live here. I'd never been through the vault door, didn't even know what was on the other side. I honestly thought it was just there for decoration, for atmosphere. In my six months as an employee of Video Kingdom, this was the first time I'd ever seen it open. The guy spun the combination, hiding his activity behind a cupped arm, like that annoying kid in class who wouldn't let you copy up his test. I heard a heavy click. He cranked the handle, and the vault door wheezed open. The skeevy guy slipped inside, slamming it shut before I got a good look at what stood beyond. It nagged the hell out of me, like an itch you can't scratch. I had to know what was beyond that door, but I knew better than to ask questions in a place like this. I was the highest paid video store clerk in the world for a reason. I could have gone to Carl. Carl as in The Dungeon by Carl Hinton. Fake name, obviously, but a real enough guy. He was short, big personality, like a Danny DeVito type. I had only met him a few times, but he'd always treated me like a son. Slaps on the back, mussing my hair. Hell, he even called me son. But I didn't go to Carl, because asking questions meant I was curious. And you don't get curious, unless you're interested in the merchandise. So, I decided to check it out on my own. Christmas Eve, slowest night of the year, I was clerking the dungeon while my colleague ran the upstairs. It had been empty for a while, so I decided to take a peek. Had I known the guy from a few months ago would be showing up, the one I first saw enter the vault, I would have kept my ass glued to the chair. I wouldn't have gotten curious. What was the damn combination? I tried a few random spins. 11, 12, 63, JFK's assassination, 04, 20, 1998, Hitler's birthday, no dice. The vault was locked down. I thought, racked my brain. Then it hit me like a freight train. The Kissinger tape. That was one of our videos I'd seen. Carl made all the newcomers watch it. It was the first known snuff film. It was like the Santa Claus of the forbidden VHS community, a white whale, 
rare and iconic. Anyone who's familiar with it and worth their scruff can tell you what day it was filmed on. That was easy. Thanksgiving, 1929. I remember watching it for the first time. A sepia tone nightmare. A galaxy of grain shooting across each gory frame. I won't tell you what's on it. Well, what the hell. It stars a family of Depression-era farmers tied up in a field. Ma, Pa, Grandma, Grandpa, and two gangly teenage boys on the wrong end of their horse-pulled plow. Story goes that they had some beef with one of the big corporations who owned their land. That was how the man got you back then. You sold some of your land for loans to buy seeds or whatever, and once you took the loans, there was no getting out from under them. The corporations would twist and squeeze until you owned nothing but the clothes on your back. Pa was clever, figured it out, started corralling up all the farmers in a union to expose the banks. Banks didn't like that, so they hired some outside hands to make an example. And it was made at 24 frames per second. Now here I was, some 50 years later, spinning their death date on a dial. I spun to 29 and heard a satisfying click. It had worked. My hand was shaking, trembling a little. Shot with adrenaline, I gripped the vault's handle, spun the wheel, thunk. The vault door wheezed open, stale air and darkness spilled out. There was a bucket of flashlights on the floor. I grabbed one and clicked it on. A cone of light shot ahead, illuminating a bank vault. Metal walls crushed in. Pegs drilled into the walls held various weapons. It was like a screwed up toy box. Guns, knives, razor wire, chainsaws, hacksaws, pliers, scalpels. Everything that cuts and scrapes and plays with nerve endings was hanging from the walls. There was a pit in my stomach. Not just at the collection of tools, but at the gaping hole eating through the back wall of the vault. It had been tunneled through the flowered steel, a narrow, rocky corridor snaking off into the earth. I inched towards it, hesitant, my heart beating its fist against my eardrums. I grabbed the scalpel off the wall, tucked it into my pockets as I moved into the corridor, figuring I might need a weapon for what loomed ahead. I left the vault door cracked, listening for movement beyond. I didn't hear any. Didn't hear the basement dwelling guy from before enter the dungeon. Didn't hear him follow me into the vault. I had already found my way into the studio by then. The passageway was rocky and claustrophobic, just tall enough so that I didn't have to stoop. After 20 minutes of barking my shins and elbows on the narrow, craggy walls, I hit a dead end. I exhaled, irritated and relieved. A horse race of thoughts had been galloping through my head as to what I might find. I was glad my worst nightmares weren't about to materialize. Then I looked closer and saw a false panel blocking off the egress. I moved the panel aside and stepped forward, finding myself in a crowded basement space. There was furniture, beds, set pieces stacked high. It was like a prop house that a movie studio might employ for set design. There was a concrete ramp at one end. I hesitated, not sure I wanted to see what it led to. But of course I did. I navigated the crowded room up the concrete ramp. It fed me into a soundstage. That was a wide, warehouse-like space with soundproofed walls and a network of dead, overhead lights surrounding a number of different movie sets. There was a pink bedroom, an executive-type office, an outdoor-styled scene in a mock forest. There were a few others I couldn't quite decipher from my vantage. It was quiet. And then, it wasn't. There was a delicate sound, like an animal caught in a snare. A slight whimpering laced into the silence. My whole body felt empty, like it was encased in drying concrete. It was hard to move, breathe. I inched toward the noise, hyper aware of every movement, every crash thud of my heart, each breath soaring through my lungs. I nosed toward the whimpers and saw cages resolve out of the gloom. Lots of them, a dozen, maybe two. Inside, like tired, broken animals, were men and women, 
naked, cuffed, ball gagged, curled up in a soup of their own filth. Most were limp, unconscious. A few were bleary, nodding in and out of consciousness as whatever drugs they were on wore out. An icy bolt of dread shot through me. We weren't just the supplier of rare tapes, we weren't just the distributor. We were a producer. Carl Hinton made our videos, most of them at least. I heard footsteps behind me, started to turn. Thud. Something hard and blunt cracked across my skull. A light bulb popped behind my eyes. I crashed down, into darkness. I knew my hands and legs were restrained, even before I opened my eyes. I could feel the cuffs digging into my flesh. My eyes eased open, blinding light hammered my pupils, a violent white light from overhead hurt my eyes, stung them. Slowly, a movie set resolved around me. It was a beige office, crowded with paperwork and boxes of VHS tapes. I recognized it immediately, a facsimile of Carl's office, an exact detail for detail replica. A camera locked off in one corner, trained on me. I looked down at myself. I was still in my work uniform, hands and legs fettered to a bolted down chair. I struggled, groaned, heard hushed voices. My back was to the door, so I had to fight in my seat for enough leverage to look around. The door opened. Carl Hinton entered. For an instant, I saw past him into the area beyond the set. I saw the greasy basement dweller with a suit who was handing over her stuffed duffel bag. Then the door swung shut and Carl took his place behind the desk. Sorry it had to be this way, son, he said sadly, but it would have ended here either way. We don't do severance or 401k at Video Kingdom. He smiled at his little joke, like it was the funniest thing in the world. I tried to ask him what the hell was going on, but I couldn't. I was gagged. Muted syllables escaped. Carl frowned. Don't bother, kid. You're fired. That's a segment we do from time to time. When the video employees of the dungeon hit expiration, you're fired. We don't stock it at Video Kingdom for obvious reasons, but I hear it's a big hit in Japan. I struggled against my binds, fought, screamed into my gag. Carl just watched, slightly amused. Go on, keep it up. They love it. You know they do. You're giving them what they want. I fought harder, rattling my binds until my wrists bled. Carl sighed. The guy who's going to fix you is a regular, real vanilla Joe, but he pays well. He'll sore open your throat. One and done. You won't suffer. I screamed something into my gag. He smiled, piecing together my question. Nobody will come looking, son. We're producing your paperwork, so it'll look like you got fired two weeks ago. I liked you, kid. I really did. Sorry it had to be like this. He got up and left. I struggled for a while, not sure how long. At some point, the guy in the suit passed through the room like a cold draft. A real plain guy. Might tell insurance, maybe real estate. Probably has a wife and a few pups back at home. Maybe a pool. He fingered the camera. A red recording light blinked on. With a sigh that said, Sheesh, this is not the position I want to be in. He claimed the spot behind the desk, pretending to be my boss. He was practically vibrating with excitement as he started through a poorly written script about how my employment was being terminated. I didn't hear any of it. I was focused on something else. The scalpel I tucked into my back pocket. My hands grazed the handle just out of reach. I strained harder, vaguely aware that the guy was done talking. He was now rising producing a big bowie knife with a serrated blade. He was walking over to me. I could smell his aftershave. Something minty. I got a scalpel between the tips of my fingers. He yanked my head back, exposing my neck, getting ready to slice through the big net of veins pumping blood into my brain. The bowie knife went up. The scalpel slid out, slipped, fell. I reached out and caught it in time. 
the bowie knife came down. I saw a wink of light of its polished blade. I gripped the scalpel and stabbed. It was a blind stab, inhibited by my lack of wrist movement. But he was right behind me and standing crotch level within the arc of my swing. The scalpel sunk through hot flesh. I felt it burrow through skin and gristle. I felt it pop as it sunk further in. When he screamed, the bowie knife went tumbling. I knew I'd caught him in the balls. I fumbled the scalpel, nearly dropped it. It was greasy with blood and fluid. I got my grip on it, plunged it into the handcuff lock. It worked. Click. The handcuff sprung, fell away. The suit was rolling around, gripping his groin. Blood roared through his fingers as he was howling. Agony. I bent down for my leg fetters as the door flew open. Carl and the basement dweller tried to rush in at the same time. They got stuck in the doorway. It was a bit of slapstick, which would have been comical had I not been on the wrong end of a snuff movie. My leg fetters fell free. By now, Carl and the basement dwelling Van Helsing had stormed the room. My scalpel flew up, caught Van Helsing in the jugular. He flopped back, a great spray of arterial blood shooting from his neck. Carl grabbed me, shoved me back. We hit a wall. Framed pictures of the ocean hit the floor and shattered. Carl throttled my neck, his knuckles digging in and sealing off my windpipe. I stabbed blindly. The scalpel went through his cheek with a sickening ease. I ripped up. I missed the blood sneezed out as I opened his face like a zipper. He grunted, howled, lost his grip on my neck. His hands went up to his face, trying to wrench free the scalpel embedded there. I planted my foot in Carl's stomach and kicked with everything I could muster. He flew back, toppling ass over tea kettle over his desk. I heard bones break. The room was a mess of screams and blood. I popped the VHS tape out of the camera and bolted for freedom. I was about to stuff it in my pocket when my gaze caught the duffel bag I had seen the suit hand over. I ripped it open and was met with cash. Lots of it. Enough to run away on. Enough to start anew. I shoved in the VHS and grabbed the duffel, never looking back. I don't know if any of them survived, but I do know Video Kingdom remained open. It held its spot in the Seattle Yellow Pages until it closed. I would send for the local Yellow Pages each year, have them mail it to my little corner of America, along with a newspaper, which I would pore over for articles about my old boss. I never saw any. Since then, my world is limited to a quiet cabin in the woods and my weekly trips to town for essentials. Otherwise, I keep to myself, always looking over my shoulder, always carrying the guilt over those men and women I left behind. Guilt over the things I haven't done about what I've seen. You probably think I would have gone to the police. I didn't. I took the tape and ran. Had I forfeited the footage, I would have lost all leverage against the people who wanted me dead. That VHS is my bargaining chip. All I have left. After I escaped the dungeon, I mailed an anonymous letter to Video Kingdom telling them I'd made copies, which would be screening in every police precinct in Seattle, if I were ever harmed. This was a lie. There was only one copy of the tape, and it was hiding in my shoebox under my bed, along with the little cash I had left. I started this transcript because... I've been seeing strange things lately. Fresh faces in town, SUVs with tinted windows. I can't help but feel they're following me, watching. And sometimes, if I stare at those tinted windows long enough, I can see the eye of a video camera on the other side. Right, I said, raising my voice on deck to make sure I could be heard. There are four of us, me up front and three others lounging around on deck chairs. What have we got so far? The anchor's bad, Cole answered, sitting upright to rub a hand over his shaved head. I'm not sure I'll be able to get it up. It's held out for 30 years and isn't coming easy. Well, we kind of need to get it up, I replied. 
especially if we're going to get this baby back to a dock. If we need to, he said, we can cut it, but I'm not sure we've got anything that can do the job. I'll speak to Chasm's men, I replied. How's the rudder? Looking good, Gareth answered. The rudder is good. Anything else? We found a leak, Charlie said, crossing a boot to the sigh. Bottom deck is flooded, but we can't be sure where the water level is still. A leak's bad news, Gareth groaned. It is, I said. Let's get down there. Charlie, Cole, you ready for a dive? Aye aye, they cried. Already brought the suits up, Charlie added. Sounds good, I said. Let's get going. With that, Charlie and Cole left. Out of all of us, they had the hardest job, and from the keen looks in their eyes as they made their way below the deck, they took it seriously. I nodded approvingly at Gareth as he walked over. He handed me a coffee, and we began to carefully pick our way across the open deck where we stood. It looked like it had been a sunbathing area with a nearby bar. Now, all that furniture was just broken wreckage left strewn across the floor. They're good guys, I said. They're taking all of this well. It does seem pretty good on paper, doesn't it? Gareth said. We had been hired ahead of any other crew and sent to board the ship on our own. Our job was to have some kind of inventory ready to go the second the buyer's crew arrived. After that, we would organise and manage the repair effort based on our initial reports. It does, I said. I would say that. Except... Nothing about this place feels good, Gareth asked. You have to wonder, don't you, looking at all this mess. I picked up an old handbag that had been lying on the floor. I know it was a sudden evacuation, but I'm not sure the captain went crazy like they say. You think it was something else? Gareth asked, arching one eyebrow towards me. This place is creepy, but I've just been putting it down to nerves. I don't know, I shrugged and tossed the handbag to the floor. It'd help if it was a big story, you know. If there were articles and interviews with ticked off passengers standing on some dock with dripping wet air, moaning about how the captain abandoned ship for no damn reason. I showed him the purse I'd taken from the handbag, opening it up to reveal a faded driver's license. I just get a funny feeling when I look at stuff like this. I know it was 30 years ago, but you'd think there'd be something online, wouldn't you? The rescue effort must have been huge. You think conspiracy? I don't know, I said. This place just feels... weird. It's just the heebie-jeebies, he replied, doing his best to make both of us feel better. Besides, I mean, well, we're here now. True, I nodded. You're probably right. Just the heebie-jeebies. Gareth chuckled at my use of probably. I gotta go, he said. This conversation isn't doing me any favours. I waited for him to leave shouting a final thanks for the coffee. He waved goodbye, and I watched him turn a corner. Once he was gone, I opened the purse again and ruffled through the papers. Most of them were old receipts, but something caught my eye. A folded square of old paper towel, something taken from a dining table perhaps. It was wrapped around an old dinner knife, the tip snapped off and nowhere to be seen. I unrolled it and found a message written in old lipstick. The writing was desperate, the letters jagged and harsh. They hurt me, it read. What the hell is that supposed to mean? I whispered. Get up here, Gareth's voice sounded tinny and distant. I was alone, hearing it filtered through the radio at my waist. What is it? I asked. You've... to come... nuts, you, you won't... For goodness sake, I grumbled. All right, where are you? Top deck. It's... Zing. Gareth, you still there? I cried before resigning myself to a short walk. This better be good. Only, when I climbed all the way to the top deck, I found it empty. Deck chairs were stacked toward the aft, and parasols, bleached white in the sun, lay torn and lifeless along the floor. Occasionally, a gust of wind would catch one of the shredded flaps, and it would struggle like a bird with a broken wing the sudden sound touching a nerve deep inside me. Most of this deck was taken up by a large swimming pool, the scum-covered surface disturbed only by old foam toys and deflated beach balls that floated eerily in the wind. 
Each one was a furry shape engulfed in algae, pacing those choked waters like patient predators. Directly ahead was a water slide, a twisting multicolored tunnel of plastic that rose upwards with 30 feet. It looked faded and pale and was grown over with speckles of green algae. Halfway up one of the sections turned transparent, offering a once tantalizing view of the sea. Something caught my eye up there, and to get a better view, I walked around the edge of the pool until the acrylic caught the sun and I could see right through it. There was a fuzzy, dark shape. Something that if I squinted just right, looked like it could be big enough for a person. Suddenly, my radio flared up and I caught the tail end of Gareth's voice. Gotta help. Stuck. Damn. The shape moved silently against the hard plastic. It looked like there could be someone stuck up there. Is that him? I wondered. Gareth, where are you? Up. Just. Up here. It must be him, I decided. And I couldn't quite work out how to feel about that. I sure as hell wanted to be angry. I had to assume it was him, didn't I? There was no one else it had to be. And that meant I'd have to crawl up there and help him out. And that... I guess that's where my thoughts started to dribble away like candle wax, because going up there was just about the scariest thing I could imagine doing. It wasn't just the thought of the danger, it was that place. Even just walking around the pool, stepping quietly over old swimsuits and dropped champagne flutes, I felt as if any second, something was going to lunge out and pull me down and I would disappear into that opaque, slimy water. The pool would be deathly still within seconds. And if anyone came looking, they'd never known I'd been up there. They'd never even know what happened. Gareth, I cried as I reached the foot of the ladder. This is seriously a stupid thing you've done. I must be alone up here, I told myself, barring Gareth. I know I am, because nothing else makes sense. No one's aboard this thing except us. And if I'm alone, then I have to help. There are no two ways about it. He could get seriously hurt in the time it takes me to find the others. Any feelings I have about those murky waters are irrational. Just like that old church I had to walk past as a kid. It looks scary. That was all. This place looks scary. But it's dead. Lifeless. Nothing to be afraid of. So, I took my first step and immediately noticed the awful noise that rickety frame made. Every footfall on the ladder rattled all that metal and the plastic slides like an earthquake, and it took every ounce of courage to get up there. I'm not often afraid of heights, but up there, you felt like you were stood on a collapsing tower. Every gentle turn of the ship was magnified a thousandfold so that even I started to feel a pang of seasickness. Not thinking, I crawled towards the tunnel entrance and went in head first hoping to get this all over and done with. The plastic was dry as a bone, and my hand gripped it easily. So that was something. I pulled myself along at a good pace, uncomfortably aware of how the claustrophobic tube was made for bodies much smaller than mine. How Gareth had probably thought it was a good idea to go down was beyond me, and I spent most of the way swearing quietly under my breath. The furious mutterings was a nice release, enough to keep me going until I reached the acrylic see-through tube. Somehow, the space before me was empty. I'd arrived at the midsection, only to find a scratched view of the cloudy sky. For a moment, I replayed events in my head. Had I seen what I thought I had? Or had he simply gotten free? But there was no way he could have gone down. With the way the slide was shaking, I would have noticed. And he definitely didn't come my way but the proof was before my eyes. He wasn't there. I was alone. Gareth, I cried. What the hell are you playing at? I don't know why I shouted anything. I hadn't wanted to hear a reply, not even from Gareth. What I wanted, always slowly expanding in my mind like a blooming star eclipsing every other thought, was to get the hell out. But something did reply. A thud, a loud and angry sound coming from the very bottom of the tunnel, out of sight. And I didn't just hear it, I felt it. The tunnel shook, the vibrations passed up my hands. 
Another thud, and my whole body locked down with terror. Something is coming, I thought. My skin grew cold, my scalp tightened, and my heart started skipping every other beat. There were a few explorative thumps before they exploded into a galloping spring, the owner barreling of that slide with unseen fury. Something inside me finally broke. I began to backpedal in a crab walk, not even bothering to turn. Only now, my hands gripped nothing. The once firm plastic was smooth and slick, and I couldn't get enough traction to pull myself upwards. I lost all coordination and had to fight with everything I had just to keep myself in one place, my feet kicking black marks into the vinyl and my hands squeaking against the plastic. I wanted to turn, but I couldn't take my eyes off that bend in the tunnel. What would come around there, I thought. What stinking wet thing is speeding towards me? I don't know if it was sweat or just clumsiness, but eventually what little grip I had had gave way. The tunnel seemed steeper than it ever had before, and gravity finally started to bear my weight downwards. For long, agonizing seconds, the plastic was as slippery as ice, and I was helpless to stop myself moving. My mind turned white hot with terror, and all my thoughts were burned away and replaced with a near hallucinatory state of despair. I screamed the whole way down, only to land in that wretched green water with a bassy plunk, the soup like water too thick to give off any splash. I broke the water in a state of total hysteria, gagging as I sucked in lungfuls of rotten miasma. That organic soup had been stewing for three decades, and if I had to guess, I was the first thing to break the surface for a long, long time. The result was near intoxicating, enough to leave me on the cusp of unconsciousness, but I fought to stay lucid and pushed through that stringy muck, its hairy tendrils clinging to my wrists and ankles with an almost lifelike animation and heave myself over the pool's edge to collapse on the floor. There I lay panting, confused and desperate, only to hear something else come from the pool beside me. Kaplunk. The water looked undisturbed, but then again it would, wouldn't it? It was hardly even water, more like a tangle of weeds and slimy algae suspended in ooze. Something was in there, I knew it. It was an irrational thought, one of many I'd had in the last few minutes, but God, I was certain that there was something in that damned water. Another sound, a loud screech, the sound of a child riding a slide. I looked up and saw the water side's mouth rimmed with a dozen pale hands. Children's hands, their owners crouched out of sight in darkness. I ran screaming from that deck, unable to wait any longer unwilling to take the risk of seeing who, or what, would emerge from that water. Gareth found me lowering bags under the deck of our yacht below, my clothes rancid and dripping wet. I jumped when he called my name, and he jogged over with concern on his face. We're leaving, I said as soon as it was in hearing range. We're getting the hell out of Dodge. Get Cole, get Charlie, let's go. I could see that Gareth was about to tell me something urgent, but then the state of my clothes caught his eye, and he stopped himself. What happened? he asked. I don't know, I said. Did you radio me to get up on the top deck? No, he shook his head. Have you spoken to me at all this morning, after our meeting? No. So you didn't stay in contact with- What are you on about? I haven't radioed you once. What the hell happened to you? Did- Did you go for a swim? he asked incredulously. Not voluntarily, I answered, and I didn't go alone. What is that supposed to mean? This place is screwed, I said. Something is aboard this ship, and it took a shot at me, and I'm not about to give it a second chance. Get Charlie and Cole before they dive. Tell them we're leaving in the next 20 minutes. Gareth's face darkened. Cole hasn't surfaced, he said. They went down but never came back up and Charlie's down there, passed out. I didn't want to move her, but I don't know what's wrong. Did someone attack you up there? Do you know if they hurt Cole? I didn't have time to explain everything to Gareth, so I grabbed him and tried to give him the cliff notes as we hurried to where he'd left Charlie down below. He kept poking holes in my story along the way, and oh boy did that tick me off. I had to guess he was trying to rationalize it, but I felt like he was maybe missing the point. 
we weren't alone. And that was all I needed to set my ass sailing towards the horizon. By the time we reached Charlie, I think I'd certainly spooked the guy a little bit. He looked shaken up, but I'm not sure he believed my story word for word, like he thought I'd maybe taken a tumble and knocked my head on the way down that slide. Not that it mattered, something I was reminded of when we found Charlie changing out of a suit. She was in a mad rush. We need to go, now, she cried, scrambling towards us with her things in hand. We can't leave, Gareth said. We have to get Cole. Nuh-uh, Charlie shook her head. He's gone. Whatever was down there, it got him. We gotta go. You sure? I asked. Yes, she answered. I tried. Believe me, I tried, but... But he's gone. Let's go, I said. For the love of God, let's just go. To our soul-crushing horror, when we reached the railing, we found nothing but grey water staring up at us. Perplexed, I reached out to give the rope a tug, almost as if to check the very truth of my senses. Just a short while ago, I'd been climbing that rope and loading the yacht below. By definition, the yacht had to be wherever the rope was. They simply had to be together. So, how could there be one without the other? We stood there in a traumatized silence, until at last, Gareth spoke up. What happened down there, Charlie? He asked. What the hell is going on? Give it up, I said, as Gareth tried the backup radio for what must have been the hundredth time that hour. We know Chasm's men will be here sooner or later. It's just stupid, he cried. It was working this morning, all of them were. How the hell are going to be down now? We have a radio, a backup, a backup for the backup, four different satellite- It's this place, Charlie said, her legs pulled up to her chest as she took a long drag from a cigarette. It's got us where it wants us. What the hell does that even mean? Gareth cried. You know exactly what I mean, she said. I told you plain as day, something took coal. One second he was there, the next he was not. You can't even say what it is, he replied. For all you know, he got stuck in something, and we could- He's dead, Gareth. I found his damn mask. There could be an air pot- He's dead, Charlie said, slowly withdrawing back into herself, her eyes glazed over. That leak we found was repaired. We weren't the first to come here and try patching her up, and whatever got the last people before they could pump the water is going to get us next. Charlie, I said, sitting beside her with deep concern. It would help me a lot if we knew what we were dealing with. What else did you see? She shuddered and took a long, slow breath. People, she said. Or bodies. Lots and lots and lots of them. I'd say two. Maybe three dozen. All of them were crew. Those white little uniforms gone grey and rotten in the water. I saw a few officers down there, I think. They were just bones, so it looked almost like coral at first. Until I got closer. That was where I found Cole's mask, sticking out from old ribs and femurs like it had always been there. But it was his alright. All those bones were piled up against one wall like those people had been crawling towards it. Something had been drawn on it, maybe. I don't know. It looked charred like fire had been taken to it. I couldn't look at it long though. Seeing that mask, those bones, it just... We're not alone. I know you don't believe me, but I'm telling you, we're not alone. I wasn't in that water alone. Things moved. The currents, you could feel them crawling across your skin, and the shadows never stayed still. There was something down there, just out of sight. Always just out of my damn sight. It had me going in circles until my damn air nearly ran out. If I'd kept going, kept trying to find it, and really laying my hands on it, I would have drowned down there too. You know the last thing Cole said to me before he went missing? Before something snatched him right out from under my nose? He said, Who's that? Something about Charlie's story wormed its way right into my head. I could practically see that place with all those dead skeletons trying to claw their way towards God knows what. I could sense and feel the deathly silence hanging in the water. Damn was just about all I could manage to say, muttering it under my breath. Well, what do we do now? Gareth asked. And that was when someone knocked on the door. 
room service. The voice was Cole's. Sir, I've been asked to bring you some room service on the house. I couldn't quite believe my eyes. Cole was standing just outside the door, back straight and arms to his side. A trolley full of hidden silver dishes was beside him. He looked paler than he ever had in life, like a powdered corpse. He was shaking and a thin trickle of sweat rolled across his brow. His eyes fixated on some distant spot behind me. Cole? Charlie heard me say his name, and she immediately rushed over and pushed me aside. She saw it was him. Really, truly him. But before she could get close, something stopped her. It was the same thing that had kept me frozen at the doorway. Cole didn't really look like Cole. It was him, sure, but he looked like he'd gone through the ringer, like he was watching his child's coffin get lowered into the ground. He kept licking his lips like he was going to say something, only he didn't quite seem sure of what. Cole, what happened to you? Quite the spread, sir, he said, putting his hand on the trolley's handle. It's, it's on the house. His words were wooden, like a recited script. For some reason, I imagined a hostage speaking into a phone with a gun against their head. That was exactly what he looked like. He was expecting something of us, I'm sure, but I couldn't say what. By now, Gareth was behind me, every bit as confused as the rest of us. Cole smiled like he was about to burst into tears, and then he turned stiffly and walked away. We exchanged brief looks of confusion and immediately followed, calling and shouting for him to stop, but he only sped up. He moved quickly as well. Whenever we got close, he'd turn a corner, and by the time we made it around, he'd be down the corridor. Only, he never ran. He was always impossibly far ahead after every twist and turn. It was as if he was sprinting when out of sight, and slowing to a leisurely walk whenever we got close. But why, I thought, what the hell is he playing at? The chase didn't last long. He soon disappeared from sight, and we were left alone in just another one of the endless velvet corridors. I tried to see where he might have gone, but it was useless to look for him. He could have been anywhere. In despondent silence, we returned to our room, only to suddenly remember the trolley he'd left behind. We lifted each lid and found plates covered in rancid mulch, the food so rotten you couldn't even tell what it had once been. Why would he want us to eat this? Gareth asked. Was that even him? I'd like to take a look at the kitchen, I said. I'd like to know where this came from. The food had been scooped out of some rotten sacks around the back. Ancient vacuum sealed packs of beef torn open and plopped onto cracked ceramic in a hysterical rush. You could see where he dropped plates and old meat and had to start again. You could also see a half dozen hypodermic needles littered around the ground, and on one countertop was a plain old toolbox filled with every type of sedative you could imagine. It was an old thing, the hinges rusted, but a grimy outline in one of the cupboards close to the back let me know it had always been a fixture of that kitchen. I couldn't help but think of that note I'd found in the old handbag. They hurt us. That asshole tried to drug us. Do you think he's gone nuts? Gareth asked. I think we have a job ahead of us, I answered. I think we need to go back to our rooms and figure out our supply situation. I also think we need to work out shifts for keeping a watch during the night. So you think he wants to hurt us? Gareth nodded towards the toolbox. I don't understand what happened to him. We've known him for years. I don't think it's him we need to worry about, Charlie answered. It's whatever got to him. Something was hissing. I was sure of it. I was up late watching over the others and something in the room was letting out a quiet whisper of white static. Gareth and Charlie were both asleep and I was halfway through the midnight watch. At 4am, Gareth would wake up and take over and I'd finally get some rest. But until then, it was just me and my thoughts. 
and the deeply worrying sound of coal occasionally shuffling around somewhere in the distance. And that hiss. If only I could figure out where it was coming from. But I was reticent to start walking around in case I woke the others. God, we were tense enough as it was, without me worrying over some little thing. I tried to focus on the front door, hoping that whoever else was on this ship would leave us alone. At least we had a fair amount of supplies. We brought enough to last the whole stay, something we had to Gareth's peculiarly anxious mind. He was always doing things like that, stashing away enough food for twice the journey and always bringing backups for backups. I quietly thanked him while I drank from a bottle of coke. I paused with a bottle to my lips, hearing the carbonated bubbles hiss against my lips. I brought the bottle back down and screwed the cap on. The hiss diminished, but it didn't disappear. And when I shook the bottle, it rose to a shrill whistle. Carefully examining the lid, I noticed a tiny hole in the plastic. It was so small that when I tipped the bottle, nothing flowed out. But once upright, the pressure was high enough to force a tiny trickle of air back out. What the hell, I muttered, speaking aloud for the first time in a few hours. Only my words sounded a little slurred, and my lips had felt a little weak. I thought of the needles in that kitchen, of the sheer quantity of sedatives tucked away. I rushed over to the stack of bottles we had and began to pull them out, cursing as my arms and legs grew weak and sluggish. Every bottle had a tiny pinprick on the top. Guys, I whispered, my limbs so numb I had to crawl my way over to the two sleeping forms. Charlie. I reached out and shook her, but she did not wake. She was sleeping so heavy she barely looked alive. We'd all been eating and drinking from that stock. It was our own, so we'd assumed it was safe. But of course, Cole would have known about it. Damn, I cried, falling backwards and feeling the world start to swim around me. The last thing I heard was the sound of our door opening and Cole muttering quietly under his breath. He's hungry. Dave, wake up. I had to fight to pull myself up. I'd been left on the floor where I'd fallen, my neck and shoulders badly hurt. Slowly, I realised... I hadn't left the room, and I wondered if I'd dreamed the whole thing. Then Charlie spoke again, and the nightmare was renewed. He's gone, Dave, Charlie cried. He's gone. Gareth is gone. I looked around and saw his sleeping bag was empty. He drugged us, I grunted, grabbing the nearby bottle and handing it to Charlie. He injected something in the lid. Look. Damn, she screamed hurling the bottle against the wall where he bounced harmlessly onto the floor. He must have come here when we went looking in the kitchen. We need to search for him, I said. The medical facility aboard the ship was small, but densely packed with chairs, tables, and dozens of cabinets. When the ship once sailed, there would have maybe been a few medics, or a single doctor aboard, to treat mild injuries or illnesses. But should anything severe happen... Most cruise ships simply turned around and dumped the injured passengers at a port to seek medical help on land. So why did this one have an operating theatre, I wondered. When I first saw that gurney with leather straps and overhead light, I thought I simply had to be mistaken. But there was no denying it. The tanks full of nitrous and other gases, the trolley full of rusted scalpels. Jesus, the drain on the floor to collect any blood. This wasn't your average professional operating theatre. The straps to restrain the table's occupant made that pretty clear. It was a small DIY space, with no real room to move or do anything except get someone horizontal and begin cutting away with no thought to what came after. The doorway had been hidden behind old filing cabinets that had since toppled over, and you got a powerful sense you were standing in a place that was meant to be secret. It had been Gareth's screams that led us to that place. We never did find him, at least not there and then. But we chased those shrill cries for help from one end of the ship to the other, until, at last, we tracked it to this tiny little space. Charlie said we must have been late, and I didn't have the guts to say anything else afterwards. 
that overhead light had been on when we first entered. The padlock to the door opened and lying on the floor, and all along that table were little channels filled with blood that dripped slowly onto the floor, ready to circle the drain. Yes, I thought. We were too late. We didn't find much else to clue us in as to what happened to Gareth, but we did find an old doctor's bag with paperwork stuffed inside. It didn't make much sense, but reading it. God, you got a horrible feeling you were reading the product of a twisted or broken mind. Passenger salts will be ready for collection between midnight and 0200 hours. Do not return later than 0400. Passenger sleeps with company. Observations show they are both early risers. Passenger Lauren will be ready for collection between midnight and 0200 hours. Passenger Lauren is a single occupancy cabin. Observations show she sleeps late due to nightly alcohol consumption. Effects of alcohol withdrawal may be used to mask effective sedatives. Prepare her cabin appropriately upon her return. Passenger Jacobson will be ready for collection between 1200 and 1400 hours. Passenger Jacobson will be staying with a childcare facility on deck 3. Crew member Fillon will prepare passenger Jacobson for collection. Use of sedatives unnecessary given passenger's age. Reports of behavioural problems to be prepared for parents' return at 1800 hours. If parents seek to escalate, the matter may be brought to the medical department where appropriate documents and diagnosis will be devised to diminish the impact of passenger Jacobson's narrative. Passengers Morris, Athley and Subton have been selected for further observation. In the event they are inappropriate for collection, passengers Weddell, Gibson and Gillett remain potential alternatives. Further notes, crew member Eileen Tucson has filed a report with the captain. She has expressed concern regarding safety of children aboard the ship, citing several mentions of the hungry man. This is the third report since she joined the crew four months ago. Following complaints regarding kitchen and medical staff, report was intercepted. Crew member Tucson was reprimanded for inappropriate conduct with passengers. This was only one of dozens and dozens, and if I had to guess, there was probably a place somewhere on this ship where we'd find hundreds more. They were not dated, but you got a twisted sense of chronology anyway. Passenger Donaghy will be ready for collection between midnight and 0200 hours. Passenger Donaghy will be undergoing his third collection since starting his journey and has consequently stopped eating meals prepared by crew. Sedation is impossible. Prepare appropriately for resistance. Passenger Nguyen will be ready for collection between 1430 and 1500 hours. Observations show that passenger Nguyen is rarely separated from their spouse. Complaints or official inquiries regarding passenger Nguyen's location are to be directed towards complicit members of the medical and officer staff only. Room service personnel are on hand to provide a third, as yet unidentified, candidate for collection between the hours of midnight and 0600. Further notes, the captain has escalated the situation. His capacity for disruption is significant. We are unable to direct the ship and return to port and collect new passengers. He has reported damage to the hull that is not present and drawn significant attention from the Coast Guard. Corporate are working towards correcting the situation. Passenger population will return to normal in the coming weeks. I handed the last one to Charlie and waited for her to read it. I don't like that corporate reference, I said. I don't like that hungry man thing, she replied. What was this place? I shook my head in confusion and picked up another. This one was considerably shorter. Crew member Fillon will be ready for collection at 0600 hours. Crew should remain vigilant for collection opportunities among remaining passengers. Some activity has been reported in the nursery on deck 3. Surviving passengers have proven difficult to collect, children included. He gives as well as takes. They are changed. Further notes. Given the meager offerings, deck 1 and 2 and 3 are off limits. It is unlikely he will be satisfied with current supplies. All remaining crew should be prepared for spontaneous collection. Do not resist him. Corporate report that efforts to return the ship to fully functioning are underway, but significant resources are being directed towards containing any information leaks after the recent evacuation. We must bear this period of scarcity with stoicism. Looks like not everyone got off, I said, 
handing it to Charlie without looking. Some of the crew stayed behind, some of the passengers too. I think this place had something of a cult going on. Only Charlie wasn't listening. She wandered over to a nearby counter and, opening drawers at random, had found another sheet of paper. It was shaking so badly in her hand, I had to reach out and take it just to read the words. She didn't even resist. She just kept looking at her empty hand, her eyes wide and glistening. Passenger Gareth Jones will be ready for collection between 0200 and 0400 hours. Observations show passengers will not sleep alone. Sedatives have been prepared for entire group. Crew member Cole must wait for sedatives to take effect. Further notes. Passenger Cole Webb has joined the crew. This represents a significant increase to current staff levels. Expect passenger Jones, Wallace and Mitchell to join the crew within the week. It has been lonely. We have given so much and so has he. His gifts hurt. We had barricaded our room as best as we could, only it didn't amount for much. This time, it was not Cole or even Gareth, as I suspected he might, that came for us. It was something else that did not pretend to be anything except a monster. A clicking, drooling, shuffling thing with broken bones and sagging skin that glistened in the moonlight like rancid meat. It silently pulled our door apart with heavy breaths that gurgled wetly in the dark. You could smell its hunger, its desperation. It did not groan or cry or roar. It only worked towards its prey like a determined predator driven by nothing but a mindless animal instinct. It was in the room within minutes. We could hear it tearing the supplies we brought apart. Suitcases were hurled against the wall and tool bags tipped upside down. Its breathing grew rapid and more strained as the thing continued to search for us. Meanwhile, we hid in the room two doors down, clutching ourselves in a pitch black bathroom with our breaths held tight. Only once had I ventured to the door to look at what was tearing our room apart and a single glimpse had been enough to nearly turn my mind to jelly. Whatever was out there looked human in its general outline, but that was where the resemblance ended. I couldn't help but think of what we'd read. Is this what happens after so many collections, I wondered? Is this what will happen to Cole and Gareth if we leave them? Is this what will happen to me? I didn't want those kinds of gifts. Charlie eventually fell asleep, but I never could. I'd heard the thing wander off into the darkness, crying in rage and terror. It had wanted so badly to find us, and I knew on some level... It would never stop. Do you think it'll float? She asked. I'll swim the rest of the way if I have to, I said, giving the tiny lifeboat a kick. We'd thrown it together out of some old double doors and a few empty drums. It was desperate, but so were we. Besides, we're betting on the radios and the EPI OBS suddenly working out in the water, which I'm pretty sure they will. You think they can do that? She asked. Block our calls for help? I thought of what I'd seen in the slide, of those little hands and the quiet plunk of something falling into the water. Yes. We hauled the raft overboard and waited for it to settle. Charlie was clutching the orange duffel bag full of provisions as if it was a child, and I couldn't blame her. Things had taken a desperate turn, and all our hopes were pinned on it. We were getting ready to climb down to it, when a loud echoing bang shattered the silence. It sounded like a circuit breaker, like some great machine coming to life. Before we'd even turned, we found ourselves bathed in amber light and the whole ship was lit up in a mockery of life. Go, Charlie cried and we hurried to the rope ladder. She threw me the bag and I climbed over first and for a brief moment, Charlie and I were face to face. We'd spent the whole night cooped up in that little room, unable to sleep or relax, and we spent all day on this last-ditch effort at escape. You could see the stress and horror written across her face. She looked like a terrified child, lost and alone in the dark, and I couldn't even see what was behind her. I tried calling out, tried to warn her, but before I could get a word out, 
she was snatched from before me. Whatever it was had come out of the nearby window, shattering glass and steel like it was clay. He moved so quickly I barely registered his existence on my retina, but the slightest smear was enough to leave me paralyzed on the ladder, my muscles seized with unspeakable terror. The hungry man. She was gone in an instant, and I was left with a choice. I looked down at the raft. It was still there, bobbing away. It promised a chance to leave, a chance to get off that damn ship like I wanted to that very first day. Meanwhile, the ship continued to whir into monstrous life, and looking up towards its moonlit silhouette, I glimpsed an ancient, creaking body crouched on the nearest roof, its spider-like limbs contracted and ready to spring, waiting for me to return. It was like some shadow come to life. I took a deep breath and climbed down. They went back. The Coast Guard went back and looked for them. I told them not to bother, only they did anyway, unwilling or unable to believe my story. I hoped that over a dozen crawling from room to room had a chance of being safe, although I suspected the ship would not easily let go of fresh meat. Hearing myself say this to them, it was like hearing someone else talk. I spoke of curses and hauntings like a stark raving lunatic driven mad by exposure. I was surprised they even listened to me and tried to look for the others, but not as surprised as when they found Gareth. They took me a little more seriously after that. He'd been found in a random passenger cabin, sleeping under the covers. I dread the poor soul who first pulled back the duvet, only to find themselves face to face with a much changed Gareth. In another time, the ship would have taken its pound of meat slowly and carefully, distributing the load across several passengers each day, with a constant rotation of new ones getting on at each port. If I had to guess, what happened to Gareth was a pride of hungry lions tearing apart a zebra, something violent and insane. He died before they got a hundred meters from the ship. I'm thankful for that little mercy, although it breaks my heart to know that Cole and Charlie will never know that peace. I've thought about going back, about burning it to the ground or blowing a hole below the waterline and letting it sink. Only, I can't go near the water. Not anymore and the thought of seeing that ship rising on the horizon, I could no more return than I could fly to the moon. I simply cannot go back. Kasim acted like I'd done him a favor. He firmly believed me when I told him it was haunted, and he offloaded it as quickly as he could to some poor dupe from Bangladesh. Only a little digging showed me it was just another shell corporation for a company he owned. I'm not sure he was as ignorant as he claimed. But then again, I'm not sure it even matters. In the end, I found an old passenger, a middle-aged woman who'd been there as a child. She seemed normal, or at least pretty normal. But when I made mention of the hungry man, she lost all semblance of calm and fell into a total state of hysteria. Her husband threatened me and forced me out, but I guess that it wasn't that that bothered me too much. It was the fact that her kids had started crying as well, and for the briefest of moments, I felt a shadow pass over me, and the room had grown a little darker. And I saw something, something in the corner of my eye, the kind of thing a mad person might even want to worship as a god. His gifts hurt. I remember those words clearly. Whatever had happened to those passengers, I think they took a little piece of it back with them, carrying it inside like a smuggled package, back out, into the real world. I had spent the last 27 hours changing planes and sitting in airports. I was exhausted and I could not wait to settle in for a shower and proper food in my hotel. I was an academic, you see, a professor of geology at the University of North Carolina, to be precise. I was one of the best in my field, and I was being dragged across the planet like a graduate assistant forced to run errands. 
All of this was to help a favor for a close friend. He had given me scant information about what he was involved in, and frankly, I was quite perturbed, but I agreed to come. I did not agree to be starved, however. The whole thing started three days prior. I was in Venezuela. I had been hired by a major mining company to perform surveys to locate deposits of precious materials. The operation was a five-year contract, paying six figures each year with a bonus for major deposits found. I had lived the last 18 months in the lap of luxury, being wined and dined by executives who saw me as a ticket to potential trillions of dollars in profits. I don't mind, of course. Beluga caviar, the finest champagnes and wines, and exotic women in my villa were par for the course, and I enjoyed it to its fullest. I was fast asleep amidst my silk sheets when I heard the buzz of my mobile phone. I grumbled and tossed it to the floor. It rang three more times from a blocked number before I finally answered. It took every ounce of energy to lift my head up from the pillow and grumble a salutation, even if it was weak. What? My cotton mouth caused me to rasp the words out from parched lips. Jesus Christ, Mel. Is that you? You sound like hell. I instantly recognized the sound of my old roommate's voice. Tony, is that you? Hold on a minute, will you? I sat up, momentarily energized. Regret followed that decision, and I was forced to lay my head back down. The room continued to spin. I placed a foot on the cold hardwood floors to slow everything down. Malachi, it's good to hear your voice. How's Caracas? Toasty warm, with lots of quality scenery. I shot a glance over my shoulder at the woman who lay on the other side of the bed. What was her name again? Veronica? Valerie? Chloe, that was it. No, no it wasn't. Malachi, I need a favour. A big one. How tied down to that mining are you? I could hear the urgency in his voice. Antonio Bellina Cortez was my best friend of 25 years. We had met as freshmen in UNC and stayed together all through graduate school. He was an archaeologist at one point for the Museum of History in Raleigh, but had been off on digs for years. I had no idea what he did anymore. I can get away for a week if I need to. What's this about? We found something in Iraq, Mel. Something big, groundbreaking, revolutionary but I need your help to confirm it. You're the only man I can trust for the job, if you can hold down a security clearance. The earnestness with which he said those words tugged at my heartstrings. Listen, the Venezuelans don't particularly like Americans right now. I'm on a tight leash. I don't know if it would be the safest thing. We can pay you. Half a million US for a consulting fee, if you can make it by Friday, Tony said flatly. I could hear the disappointment in his voice, but did not have the strength to fight him about it. I'll pack a bag. See you Friday, old friend. That's how the phone conversation went. What follows was an endless torrent of emails and non-disclosure agreements I was sure to violate the hell out of to the highest bidder if given enough to drink. I was forced to fly economy, smashed against the window by a soccer mom who talked endlessly about her children in Spanish to someone else I didn't care to listen to. I left my earbuds back home. The headache, however, came along for the flight. When we landed in Mexico City, I thought about a hotel room, but my layover didn't allow for it. A six-hour delay forced me to stay in the plane. We transferred to a larger plane and touched down in Germany that evening. I was picked up by two large men in military uniforms and roughly placed into an SUV. I was driven to Ramstein Air Base and shoved into a US Air Force cargo plane with little fanfare. Without a drink, my anxiety overtook me on the flight and I threw up several times before passing out from exhaustion. We landed the next morning in Iraq. I found breakfast to be utterly lacking in every way. A 40 minute drive and I arrived at my hotel for the evening, a small military installation. I nearly fell from the cramped car as it parked on the concrete. A tall, thin man with overly slick black hair approached in an off-the-rack navy suit with brown tie. A wide smile showed perfectly straight teeth. His evenly tanned and non-blemished skin contrasted with a white shirt under his jacket. 
His deep brown eyes lit up as he saw me. I tried to stand up straight, but my back and knees did not allow it. It was oppressively hot, but he did not seem phased in the least. Tony, you could have sent a car to get me. And what's the deal with the economy plane tickets? Bah, complain, complain. Look at you. You look like an old man, practically falling apart. He let her chuckle, I interpreted as snide. Do we need to call the boo-boo bus for you? The rich lifestyle has made you a bit soft, Malachi. That's Dr. Malachi. So, what's the deal, Tony? You find Cortez's record collection in the jungle? Tony's smile faded. His eyes shifted left and right, then looked back at me. Not here, he said as he handed me a thick packet in a manila envelope. Read this over, then get some rest. I'll pick you up tomorrow after breakfast. Keep your wits about you, Malachi. You look like you drink too much. Now I brushed him off and asked him to stay for dinner. After a moment, he declined and left in a silver pickup truck. I checked into my quarters and found my long-awaited shower. A nice dinner and cocktails from the bottles of vodka I smuggled in my bags pushed me towards a deep sleep. Just a good night's rest and I'll get my day started right. I set an alarm for 6am and bought a nightcap before laying across the bed in my suit. At 4.45am, I woke up in a cold sweat and threw up in the trash can. Tony greeted me out front. It was 9 in the morning and it was already 100 degrees. He laughed relentlessly at my condition and forced a bottle of water into my hand. He inquired about breakfast, but I told him I felt under the weather. I grabbed a muffin and decided to leave. As we walked outside, I saw he had been driven in an overly large black suburban. How does this suit you, Dr. Malachi Andrew McMillan III? The sarcasm was practically palpable as he rattled off each syllable in a cartoonish, enunciated tone. I stared over the frames of my sunglasses at the car for a moment before I readjusted them. Fine, I said meekly and stepped into the open door. Tony didn't talk much. He kept his eyes glued to his tablet as he flicked through various screens. I drained the water and took a glance around the SUV's cabin. No booze here, Mal. It's a Muslim country. Only water. Oh, I think there's Pepsi in the compartment closest to you. Tony didn't even look up from his work. I cracked the can and took a long swallow before I placed the frigid aluminium against my temple. Tony shook his head slightly but said nothing. A 90 minute car ride took us deep into the desert. The endless piles of sand was somehow relaxing and poked me up a bit from my hangover. The SUV ducked off the main road and onto the dirt path. Ah, we are here, Tony said as we passed over a wooden bridge near a long dead river. Welcome to Project Colmillo, Tony said matter of factly. A huge archaeological dig site sprawled before us, covering at least one square mile. The sand had been cleared down to the rock beneath to provide space for the heavy equipment scattered all around. Trailers and makeshift buildings were crammed against a never-ending wall of dunes to the right of the entryway. On the left, the largest white tent I had ever seen was erected. It looked like the inflated dome of a football stadium, perhaps 300 feet across and 50 feet high. In the centre and just behind the structures, a pit was dug. Orange dust climbed in pillars from the pit as crew worked deep in the earth. This is not what I expected. What were you expecting exactly? Not a villa by the beach, but it's good enough for us regular folk. Tony's sheepish smile made me angry for some reason. I took another swig of my Pepsi, but said nothing as we parked. The main doors of the office building opened the most beautiful woman I had ever seen walked out. Her Class A Air Force uniform was professional, but the tailored navy blue pants left little to the imagination. Awards were plastered of the left side of the jacket. Tony and I exited the car and he strode to meet her halfway across the concrete parking lot. She hugged Tony gently and they exchanged a warm greeting before she turned to face me. I was utterly lost as I stared at her. Her straightened hair was pulled tight into a bun to keep the reddish tinted black hair just off the collar. Are you okay, Dr. McMillan? 
The woman's voice snapped me out of my trance as I realized she had spoken to me several times. What? She appeared irritated already. Not a good start. I said, welcome to hell, doctor. How was your flight? Oh, good. It was good. You look very good. This whole thing is nice. That was the best I could muster. I think part of my soul died right there on the ground in the blazing heat. She stared at me, and I could almost hear her inner voice calling me a moron. Tony face palmed over her shoulder and rubbed his forehead. Right. I am Major Jordan Broadhurst, US Air Force. Follow me, please, gentlemen. She turned and walked back towards the facility as Tony barely contained his laughter. Very smooth. Very smooth indeed, he whispered as he scanned his ID badge and we walked inside the temporary office building. Briefing in 10 minutes, gentlemen. Main conference room, Dr. Cortez. Make sure he doesn't get lost, the Major said. I couldn't help but stare as she walked down the hallway and out of sight. Tony led me to his spacious, well-furnished office. He situated himself at his desk and began to log into his computer. Several items were spread over the desk. Why is the US military on a dig site? And what does the government need with an archaeologist anyway? And why is the Air Force chick so fine? So many questions. The government always needs a good archaeologist. I spent a week with the Ark of the Covenant, you know. You will be surprised what we find buried in the dark corners of the world. Even though he was smiling, he said it so deadpan, I couldn't tell if he was joking or not. I gestured to the deformed lizard statue on the side of his desk and picked it up. A copper-tinged hexagon sat on his forehead. A dagger laid next to it, made from a reflective black stone. Probably obsidian, I thought to myself. The handle was ornately carved in the image of a serpent. It appeared to be made of bone. Your newest village trophies, I assume? A snake wrapped in bondage rope? Where did this come from? As I turned it over in my hand, I noticed how warm it was. The heat seemed to radiate outwards from the inside. I thought I heard a brief whisper behind me, but my reflexes were so slow, I barely registered it through my hangover. Recovered not pillaged, and to be honest, I'm not entirely sure. Sumerian, I think. Some sort of winged serpent deity. Unique. I got it from a Bedouin trader near the border in Iran. It gives off its own electromagnetic field, and it's slightly radioactive. He laughed as I quickly sat it back down. Relax, it's harmless. Although, it does make the computer go a bit crazy if it gets too close. It has a plate of corb night there on the head. It's in the handle of that knife too. The eyes of the snake are made of corbonite chips. My heart practically jumped from my chest. We have only ever found 29 grams of the stuff on the entire planet. Corbonite is the most powerful conductor ever discovered. It's malleable but incredibly heat resistant. Its properties are unprecedented. Why would someone put it on a flying snake statue? It's thousands of years old, Malachi. They probably didn't know what it was. The glyph carvings on the statue is also strange. Some of the symbols are cuneiform, but the others... No idea. I can't believe it. Corbonite. It's amazing. I stared with newfound appreciation of the statue. You haven't said anything about you being the one who discovered Corbonite since I brought it up. Are you not feeling well today? I beamed a wide smile at Tony. I didn't think it was my place to brag about my discoveries to my best friend on his job site first for you then. The statue does have some other odd properties. Like what, Tony? Does it whisper to you in the dark? Free me, feed me, let me loose. I growled it in my best golem voice and laughed so hard my headache came back. Tony did not. Something like that, yes. Tony did not smile. He did not move. It looked like he wasn't even breathing. He just stared at me. The coldness in his eyes was unnatural. The whole thing made me nervous. I saw he had been reviewing a photograph of what looked like an elephant tusk on his computer. I wanted to ask him about it, but his eyes bore into me and made me swallow my question. Finally, he spoke again to break the tension. Come on, it's time for you to see why you're here.
I opened another Pepsi as we entered the conference room. Eighteen chairs set around a wooden table with a large projector screen on a far wall. A laptop computer sat nearby, as well as a tablet on the table in front of each chair. I plopped myself into a cushioned chair and drank it from the can and held a cup of ice against my forehead as Tony talked to Major Broadhurst. Occasionally she would glance over at me and frown before she returned to a heated conversation. I've already screwed this up, I thought to myself. I embarrassed my friend and he has caught all the flack. The door swung open and a dozen men and women in suits entered the room. I sat up and attempted to look professional. Tony pulled up the chair next to me as the Major picked up the tablet. Good morning and I hope everyone is rested and ready to go. Today is a big day for us. Dr. McMillan has flown in from Venezuela to be with us today. He is considered one of, if not the best geologist on the planet. Doctor, did you have a chance to read through your packet? I opened my mouth and closed it again without a word. Her anger practically sliced through my entire body. She pursed her lips, kept her calm and redirected. Let's get Dr. McMillan caught up, shall we? Several months ago, an American satellite passed over the area searching for a Turkish cargo plane which crashed in the desert without a transponder. The satellite found the plane, but during the recovery, found something never seen before. The Air Force tasked my unit with using an advanced satellite to scan the area around the crash site. Further scans made us realize we needed to construct this facility to establish a permanent base of operations for study. I am here as an American liaison to the Iraqi government and technology expert. There, I saved you three hours. All caught up then. That wasn't so bad. I smiled weakly at my own joke and glanced around the room. No one smiled back. I adjusted my necktie and sunk an inch lower in my chair. Major Broadhurst continued. Dr. McMillan, if you will take a look at your tablet, please. I turned the tablet on and opened the only file on the desktop. I nearly coughed up soda onto the screen. As you can see in the images, the site is massive. The total building footprint measures 1,320 feet long and 1,660 feet wide in a rectangular pattern and is 560 feet tall and a 100 foot tall substructure on top for a total of 660 feet tall. For those of you keeping score with your arithmetic, that's real damn big. The anomalous object at the top is inside what appears to be a temple or shrine and is approximately 73 feet in diameter. We believe the anomaly to be made. This is carbonite, I exclaimed. I apologize, but the electromagnetic signature is distinct. This is incredible. You have found a deposit of the rarest metal in the solar system. What's this around it? I pointed towards the geometric building she had described and turned my tablet to face her. It was square with a large blot at its center. That is the largest cigarette ever found, Dr. McMillan. Major Broadhurst's words hung in the air for a moment. That's impossible. How is this done? Who could have done this? That's why you two are here, Doctor, to help us figure out why one of the oldest buildings ever constructed by mankind lost for God knows how many years to the desert, is built around a meteor made of the rarest element known to the solar system. Tony leaned over to me. Told you not to drink last night, Mel. I walked down a small corridor next to Tony as I flipped through image after image. Incredible, just incredible, I repeated. I could stare at these all day. Or well, all night as it were. They were in your packet, Tony said. A crew of workers have been at it for five months to remove the earth around the ziggurat. The area is incredibly dangerous, and we've been hit by two sandstorms since the dig started. It's been a very slow process, but the construction is a marvel of engineering. When can I see it? I felt like an eager schoolboy. The Corbinite, I mean. I don't care to play with your blocks. The applications are limitless. If this meter is solid, it's worth tens of billions. Maybe more if we had bidders. Yep, money. Not the archaeological find. Not the implications of a gigantic ziggurat lost the time, built by an ancient civilization. It's money. I shot Tony an apologetic glance, and he softened his tone for me. He sighed and continued. 
We can go down there in a moment. I must grab something from my office. You need to change. That jacket will not suit you in the heat, my friend. We have spared dig gear in the locker room just there. He pointed to the room directly across the hall. A pyramid? Explains why they dragged you away from your rocks in Turkey. Cigarette, not pyramid. Two different things. Tony walked into his office and stepped inside. When I exited the room in my standard tan t-shirt and old hand-me-down denim jeans, Tony was not done yet. I could hear him murmur through the door to someone. Did he really leave me outside to make a call? After two minutes, he stepped back out, closed and locked his door. He wore a safari outfit and hat. He was visibly sweating. Uh, you okay bud? You look like me after a bad night out. I said it as light-heartedly as I could. His turn was so sudden, I was worried. Fine, fine. Just feeling a bit warm in the office. He adjusted his hat strap, and we made our way out of the office and into the blistering heat of the Iraqi desert. We walked the short distance to the pit, which had been dug into the sand. Tony regained his composure a little as we approached. Major Broadhurst had changed from a uniform into a khaki button-down shirt and cargo pants with matching well-worn tan combat boots. Her sidearm was nestled against the right thigh and a dark brown leather drop holster which matched the large brown fedora bent to the brim. She beamed proudly with her fists on her hips as she stood near the edge of the pit. Her biceps were flexed and her brown skin glistened from applied suntan lotion. The entire outfit vaguely reminded me of Indiana Jones. I was totally mesmerized. It's time for your nickel tour, boys. Her enthusiasm was positively infectious. My hangover eased ever so slightly just from her energy. I peered over the side and found myself in awe. The ziggurat, a monstrous temple from the ancient world, was nearly completely excavated. The ornate carvings and colossal pillars which lined the walls were so well preserved you would have thought it was built only recently. The whole thing is built directly on bedrock. That means the 500 plus feet of sand on top of it has moved over the ages, but there is little to no corrosion or degradation to the outer walls in art. It's almost like the ziggurat was buried as soon as it was built. She showed us to a cramped, rickety elevator that resembled little more than a shark cage on a pulley system. The ride was bumpy and I said a Hail Mary on two separate occasions when I thought the whole thing was going to collapse. I hadn't said a Hail Mary since my grandmother died. What was going on with me today? I gratefully stepped out into the limestone and surveyed the excavation site. Tents scattered the ground and local workers moved sand by the wheelbarrow load from exposed doorways and windows at the base. I spotted a large cooler and greedily consumed two bottles of water from it. Tony removed the large water bottle from his satchel and took a sip. The locals eyed me angrily. I realized too late I had committed a faux pas. Standing at the base, I was truly in awe of the sheer size of the thing. It was as if a shopping mall made of sandstone and granite were as tall as a skyscraper. How's your cardio, Mal? I'll be fine. Looks like a piece of cake. Just curious, how many steps is it to the top? Major Broadhurst answered, much to my chagrin. Just under 3,000. The staircase winds around the ziggurat to various platforms. It should take about 20 minutes to reach the top. I stared at her in abject terror. We haven't finished excavating the ceremonial staircase yet. It won't be finished until Tuesday. Limber up, Doc. The Major patted me on the shoulder and started a climb. She quickly outpaced us both and waited at the first landing. We followed the superstructure of winding staircase after winding staircase. It wrapped around into rooms and antechambers. Glyphs and letters and languages I could not identify lined every square inch of the walls in each room we passed through. I was fascinated, but Tony and Major Broadhurst pushed on. Nonchalant as can be about the epic tale chiseled into the walls before us. By the time we reached the top, I felt utterly exhausted. I wanted to vomit, but I didn't even have the liquid in my stomach to dry heave. Tony handed me his bottle of water 
and I took a grateful sip. You should do more cardio. Come on, your rock is just in here. Major Broadhurst turned, and I looked upward. The gargantuan temple towered 100 feet above the top of the ziggurat. Arches formed into 15-foot openings, six on each side, beckoning us forward into the inner sanctum. Paintings of gods and monsters towered over us from floor to ceiling inside. The entire room was illuminated by a soft, warm yellow glow. I could see a tentacled eldritch terror leveling cities and devouring people by the thousands. I saw warriors of old do battle with gigantic bird-like horrors, a monstrous creature of the abyss, a leviathan of ungodly proportions, flattened a beautiful seaside village with impunity as one surviving onlooker surveyed the devastation from a hill. A mighty city with vast temples and rings of aqueducts was smashed to ruin by a tidal wave brought on by the wrath of an angry ocean god. Each painting came with line upon line of text in some language long dead and completely alien to me. It was awe-inspiring. Still thinking about your shiny metal now, Malachi? Tony stepped up next to me and clasped my shoulder. This is the biggest archaeological find since King Tut. It was at this point that I realised the light towers and generators nearby were not on. The entire shrine was illuminated by something. The Corbinite. It appeared to glow like it produced its own light from the inside. A sudden burst of light momentarily blinded us all. Major Broadhurst answered my question before I asked it. It does that sometimes when enough people get in here. Not sure why. I looked at it for the first time in earnest. The gargantuan ball of metallic ore sat at the center of the room and dwarfed us all. It was roughly spherical, with a smooth shell bearing only minor scratches and indentations. Shell? Like an egg? Hmm? What was that, Mel? Tony asked as I came back to reality. Nothing. Just thinking aloud, I guess. Looking back at the paintings lining the stone walls, I saw one on the furthest wall which caught my eye. I walked over to it and looked it over. The art was carved into the wall instead of painted. It appeared much older than the rest. It was crudely chiseled into the wall instead of ornately painted. It sent shivers down my spine, which radiated through my arms and legs in waves. It depicted a nightmarish abomination of a creature, an indescribable mass of spikes and lines with a single slitted eye at its center. The thing was surrounded by other objects. They appeared simply as rings, stacked rings being devoured by this creature. The abomination was injured, leaking a green trail across the black backdrop of the art. It was not in a lush forest or coastal city depicted by the intricate paintings which surrounded it. The backdrop was simply black. It was a blank space muddled with the occasional dot of white or red or yellow. The creature was chased by its attackers until finally the painting finished with it bound in chains as insignificantly tiny humans looked on. Isn't it spectacular? Tony's voice echoed deeply in the mammoth chamber. What are these things here? These rings? Angels. Tony said. I stared him down. Angels? In their ancient depictions, angels weren't plump little babies with halos, Malachi. They were terrifying messengers and powerful warriors. They were often depicted as stacked concentric rings with eyes and fire and blades. I remember Sunday school, Tony. This is old. Very old. What's it doing with the Corbinite? It doesn't make any sense. This temple should predate any art of Judeo-Christian angels by three or four thousand years. A shadow moved across the carvings. Gentlemen, your attention, if you please. Major Broadhurst's voice had more than a hint of stress in it. Something was moving inside the Corbinite. A deep rumble shook the shrine and dust rained upon us. A voice spoke to us from nowhere, and yet seemingly everywhere. It was slow, weak, and pained. Finally, I have been imprisoned here for so long, and you have brought my salvation. How? That's 
English, I stammered out. The voice seemed to rattle inside my head, over and over and over, until it became painful. I could only drop to my knees as I lost the equilibrium, and the words practically banged against the side of my skull. I saw images flash before my eyes, scenes of a beautiful, lush landscape on fire, and a mighty river dried out as it boiled into nothing. Clouds which rained hellfire upon everything below, a mountain spewed forth volcanic ash and steam as the sun was smothered in a blanket of darkness. No, not a sun. It was an eye. A giant, lidless eye towered over the planet. Dark and clouds of ash drifted by the cat-like slit, paling in comparative size. I could hear the eye speak, like a malevolent god proclaiming its gospel, but I could not understand it all. The word salvation repeated over and over in my head. I finally broke free of the fever dream and regained my senses. I looked up from my position on my knees and saw Tony, motionless. It was like he was not affected at all. Tony, Tony, can you hear it too? I hear it in Spanish, Tony said flatly. His voice was distorted, like he was in a daze. Major? Doesn't matter, the rock is talking, time to go. She appeared apprehensive, and a stand showed she was ready to move at a moment's notice. She was truly a woman of action. Meanwhile, I was practically crippled on the floor. The voice came again. It was soft and loving, but weak. You found me. After all this time, I shall forever be grateful to you. I felt like I could almost see a shape move inside the Corbinite. Tony spoke up, far braver than I felt in that moment. Who is speaking to us? Do you have a name? What is a name but something given by others? I once held many names. It rattled off several, each with a long, laborious breath before the next. A lack hole, a sag, the lidless flame. Samael, Reaper of Sorrows. I was once the mighty, the devourer of worlds. A deep, raspy labored breath. But now, I am just the Hidden One. A deep tremor shook the ground. Fascinating, Tony said as he took a step towards the stone. Excuse me, people. The rock said it's the devourer of worlds. Why are you trying to talk to it? I'm leaving. Let's go. Please, don't leave me here. It has been far too long. I regained my feet and retreated with Major Broadhurst as the tremors in the shrine intensified. Tony, time to go, old boy. But he did not move. He stood there in a trance. He slowly walked towards the stone and reached into his satchel. Dr. Cortez, the Major shouted. Tony turned to reveal the obsidian dagger in his right hand. In his left, he clutched the stone serpent statue from his office. He used the blade on the end to rip into his shirt. He tossed it aside. Rows of text were tattooed on his arms from shoulder to wrist. A green cat's eye took up most of his back, surrounded by rings of burning flames. He turned to face us. Blood streaked from his eyes. His chest was a mountain of scar tissue, laceration upon laceration built into a macabre display of self-mutilation. He slit his chest open with a dagger and blood poured from the wound. What the hell, Tony? I tried to run to him, but Major Broadhurst forcibly dragged me away by my arm, away from him and towards the nearest open archway. Salvation, Tony said as he held the statue to his spurt and chest wound. The blood poured over it and the Corbinite glowed softly and steadily. He raised his arm and slammed the knife into... the shell. My god, I whispered slowly. It is an egg. He shattered like glass, and a vacuum sucked the air from the room. Each of us was dragged off our feet. A silent pause. Then, an explosion sent tiny shards of Corbinite in all directions. The sand and debris settled as I crawled on my hands and knees towards the body in front of me. Tony's lifeless corpse was mangled. 
His right arm was gone from the elbow down. Both of his eyes were full of metallic shards. A three feet foot piece of shrapnel had penetrated his chest and skewered him. He was dead, but he was smiling. A small trickle of blood ran from between a gap where his teeth used to be onto the stone floor. Major Broadhurst stood over me and helped me to my feet. Visibility in the room was near zero. A voice boomed in the cavernous shrine. It was so deafening, I could hear it over the ringing in my ears. Finally. I dared a glance back. An eye the size of a car stared at me from the distance. A grotesque, bubbling biomass of fleshy tendrils expanded from the back of the green, lidless eye. Each tendril split and sprouted new ones, multiplying endlessly. When they each reached a large enough size, they slapped together in a brutal, bloody fusion to form larger tendrils. Gallons of green blood soaked every wall and surface of the shrine. The pink, fleshy tendrils intertwined into one massive strand and slammed to the floor. The eyeball attached at the end like the face on a pale worm. The thing sprouted wings and claws and teeth. Each shape seemed to grow and mutate and merge with others of its kind, only to be absorbed back into the body to form some new, horrible type of locomotion. The thin, membranous skin split and tore open as muscle tissue sprouted and entwined themselves together to form a heavily muscled serpentine form. Cancerous tumors formed and burst in seconds, revealing bony armor plates. A thunderous screech, and two wings ruptured forth from the back and rapidly expanded. A gush of blood from under the eye as a tortured, grotesque jaw formed and extended. The body finally grew to match the size of the eye as it now resembled a form like a colossal winged serpent. Each wing scraped the roof of the 100 foot ceiling and smashed stone as they continued to stretch. The mouth opened like a hideous flower, four separate jaws, each lined with dozens of stubby, blunt teeth. The orifice, which I can only vaguely say resembled a throat, spewed a froth that burned the stone as it splattered across the ground. The single eye sat on the bulbous pod at the top of the serpent's 30 foot skull, which had no skin left to cover it. The thing turned to face us, and in my head, I could hear the voice speak again. Salvation has come at last. A strong grip on my left arm, and I was yanked into daylight. The Major dragged me down the stairs three at a time. I struggled mightily to keep up. The walls of the ziggurat shook as the ground roared in protest at the presence of an ancient evil, awakened once more. The entire temple exploded into rubble. A dust cloud cascaded down the sides of the ziggurat and enveloped us completely. She never stopped though, her iron grip on my arm keeping me going. As we ran, I could hear the rush of air overhead and the billowing of sand as mighty wings took flight. I truly have no idea how we survived the trip down. We should have been crushed by stone or suffocated by dust. Instead, we reached the barren earth at the bottom of the ziggurat in relative safety. The workers had fled and the dig site was abandoned. We rode the elevator back up in complete silence. We slowly crept above the dust cloud, trapped in the pit surrounding the ziggurat. As we broke free of it at 300 feet, the sun shone down upon the ruin. The temple was gone. Pillars were smashed and nearly a quarter of the structure itself was damaged beyond recognition. Flecks of carbonite shimmered in the sunlight on the ground and all around the ziggurat itself. The abomination was nowhere to be seen. When we reached our base camp, the entire building was in a frenzy. Major Broadhurst made several calls in hushed, hurried tones. She said something about radar tracking and space telemetry, phrases which I didn't understand. My brain couldn't even comprehend everything which had happened. My best friend was dead, and that thing, it had been in my head. To this day, I have no idea where it has gone. I hope and pray it returned to whichever hellish world it came from. I can tell you, I quit my job with my company. I have not consumed a drop of alcohol in six months. I have been in the gym four days per week. 
I don't play damsel in distress well, and the major, or should I say colonel now, reminds me of it every time we speak. I'm meeting her for coffee tomorrow, which is an upgrade on every relationship I've held for the last five years. But I don't sleep as much as I used to. I still hear the voice in my head sometimes. I still see it in my dreams. I can hear the words the entity spoke to me in my vision, much clearer. It is I that sends the hordes. It is I who summons the plague. Death comes on swift wings. Salvation is here.